Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. And I have a report and then we'll go to the resolution. Angie, are you online? I am, thank you. All right, Angie, uh, you have the floor. Oh, wow. Yeah, right Thanks. off the bat. I really appreciate it, thank you. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> well, thank you, your worship and council and management for uh, having me this evening. Um, so my name is Angie Spencer and I'm a partner with BDO and uh, we have conducted the independent audit of the District of Sycamus as at December 31st. Uh, so in terms of our audit opinion, which is noted on page two and three of um, the financial statements, we have issued a clean and unqualified audit opinion, meaning that the financial statements are free of any material misstatement. Uh, and they are presented in accordance with the public sector accounting standards. So these are subject to your uh, review and approval this evening. So I'll just give a highlights of uh, some of the changes over a prior year. So um, in terms of the balance sheet, the, this is a statement of all the assets and liabilities of the district as at December 31st. Uh, total financial assets came in at 19.5 million. That's up from 18.2 million in the prior year. Some of the significant changes um, you'll see in cash and cash equivalents, uh, some uh, about 3.4 was uh, invested in portfolio investments this year. So that uh, explains the increase there. Uh, there was also an increase in accounts receivable. This is outstanding grants uh, that were received after year end uh, related to ongoing projects uh, and capital projects. <coughs> in terms of liabilities, liabilities increased from 13 million to 14.3 uh, in 2021. Uh, the largest being around deferred revenue. Again, there was um, significant grant funding that was received during 2021 that, um, you know, things such as capital projects that will be uh, spent in 2022. So those will be recognized into income uh, as those uh, monies are spent. And then lastly, in terms of tangible capital assets, uh, that went from 75.7 million up to 79.1 million. Um, most significant, there was about 5.5 million in uh, infrastructure and capital additions during the year, uh, the most significant being the bridge work um, and some additional beach upgrades in parks. Uh, so total accumulated surplus for the year came in at 18.3 um, and that's up from 80, 81, sorry, 84.3 up from 81 million in the prior year. I'll now flip to the statement of operations. So this is a summary of all of the revenue items and expenditures for the district for the year ended December 31st. Total revenues came in at 12.6 million. That's up from 11.9 million in the prior year. Uh, some significant uh, changes um, for the year. So obviously taxation is a big area of uh, income for the district and that was uh, fairly consistent with the prior year. Um, contributions to developers and property owners came in at 259,000 um, and there was a recovery in the prior year. We'd made an adjustment for um, based on a one-time um, refund that was given to a developer and agreed by uh, council at the end of uh, 2020. Government grants came in at 3.9 million. That was down slightly from 4.4 million in the prior year. Um, again, a lot of that related to the capital projects and funding um, for the housing and also for the bridge um, development. I'll move now on to expenditures. Expenditures came in at 9.3 million. Uh, that was up from prior year at 8.1. Uh, some increases there uh, in terms of protective services. So there was additional funding received included in government grants that was spent this year related to fire protection. And another area of increase was in public health and welfare services. So the new health center, which was uh, acquired and operated by the district of Sycamus uh, starting June 30th onward, that's included in those expenditures there. So the total annual surplus came in at uh, three point, just over 3.2 million, um, very consistent with the prior year. Keep in mind that surplus does not include uh, capital expenditures that were made that are, are recorded on the balance sheet. 
So that's all I had in terms of going over the kind of high level summary of the balance sheet and income statements. Uh, there are further notes to the financial statements, which just provide more detail and context to the numbers in the balance sheet and income statement. Um, the only note I wanted to highlight uh, that is kind of somewhat new and required, it was uh, brought in last year as the final note 22, which is the COVID safe 19 safety sorry, the COVID-19 restart grant. Uh, so it is a required disclosure to keep a continuity of how those funds are being spent and how much is left still to be uh, spent. Um, so during the year, there was 190,000. Um, this is fiscal 2021 that was spent and that's been disclosed in this note here. So uh, I'll now move on to, unless there's any specific questions on the um, financial statements for the district. I'll maybe pause and go through that first before we, we go through the uh, development financial statements. All right, <laughs> any questions? I don't see any hands up, Andy. Uh, okay. Carry on. Thanks very much. So now the second set of statements in front of you is the District of Sycamus Development Corporation. Um, so I will just flip forward to page three, which just gives an overview of um, the revenue and expenditures. So this is not uh, subject to an audit, but we do um, compile these statements and, and do the necessary tax filings for them. But just as an update to uh, Mayor and Council today in terms of the results for, for December 31st, 2021, total revenue uh, came in at $188,871. That was up from the prior year at $155,000. So that increase was really related to some additional uh, grant funding that was received during the year and also increased in MRDT now that things are opening up and there's uh, more you know, hotel use. Uh, operating expenses came in at $176,379. That was up from the prior year at uh, $148,000. The, the most significant increase there was around wages and benefits with a full-time um, additional employee for the full fiscal year of 2021. So total income before other income came in at $12,492,000. Um, I will note too, uh, in flipping back to the balance sheet on page two, there is about 70, close to $75,000 worth of deferred revenue. So this is additional grant funds that uh, will be utilized in 2022 as the expenditures are incurred related to those. Um, so the economic trust uh, was one of those uh, more significant grants. So I'm happy to answer any questions that there might be on those statements. All right, comments or questions from council. Boy, I'll tell you what, uh, pretty quiet group today. So you must be doing, Kelly must be doing a great job for us. Kelly's doing an excellent job. And I would like to say thank you to Kelly and also to Justin for their help in uh, getting all of the information and all the questions answered related to the audit. We always appreciate um, their patience and uh, their prompt responses. So thank you. All right, thank you. All right, um, any other comments or questions from council? Okay, then I'm going to read out the resolution. Recommendation that the District of Sikibu's 2021 Consolidated Financial Statement for the year ending December 31st, 2021, as presented by BDO Canada LLP, be approved, and that BDO Canada LLP be appointed as auditors for the 2022 fiscal year. I need a mover on this. Councillor Malmas, second by Councillor Aries. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, I'll call a question. All those in favor, carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. All right. Video um, Canada, Andy Spencer, partner, one consolidated financial statement district of Sycamus Development Corporation. Recommendation that the District of Sycamus Development Corporation 2021 financial statement for the year ending December 31st, 2021, as presented by BDO Canada LLP, be approved. I need a mover on this. Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Bushell. Any comments or questions on this? All right, I'll call a question. All those in favor, carried unanimously. Thank you. All right. 
Next. Delegation, North Okanagan IG Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's Invitation, Patrick Vance. Is in person here? Uh, unfortunately, Patrick's running a bit behind, uh, so we might want to loop back to him once he okay, arrives. Okay, we'll, we'll move back. <clears throat> right. Um, uh, whereabouts have we got the other delegate? Okay, that's yep. moving on. Okay, right. All right. Uh, so, recommendation that council resolve itself in the committee of the whole at uh, quarter after five. Moved by. Councilor Anderson, Councilor McCabe, all in favor? Carried. All right. Administration updates, um, uh, capital projects. Carol, you have the floor. Through the chair. We'll keep the theme rolling here. We just had uh, BDO talk about using up some deferred revenue. And uh, I know how to do that with some capital projects. So uh, <laughs> it was looking pretty bleak for the bridge the last couple of weeks. There wasn't a lot of activity. I think I counted eight or nine days with absolutely nothing moving at the bridge. I was growing really concerned about that. I sent some messages out to the contractor. Uh, the, the road crew for that group uh, went missing in action. I take that to mean they were reassigned somewhere else and they couldn't get them. But uh, they were back yesterday. They're back working on the riprap under the bridge, the, the big rock. We've got 48 loads left to go. So a total of 140, we got 48 left to go. They were working on it yesterday. They were working on it today. They've committed to stay with it and get the riprap done. Next week, they will do the approaches to the, to the bridge. They're going to do the roadworks. And we've got the membrane uh, installer coming to stage. So he's going to come and drop off all his stuff and get ready to go on May 20th, right before the long weekend. And then on the Tuesday, he hits it with the membrane. And I've seen, uh, I've seen some correspondence going back and forth with the membrane guy and the paving people. And we could have that surface done by the end of the month. So everybody cross their fingers. And if we can stick on uh, the schedule, we'll have that thing done. So we're getting close. That's the good news. Uh, wastewater treatment plant filter was commissioned three weeks ago. We're taking some tests now. It's too early to say how well the filter's working. This is just kind of a little update on, on what we've, we've done, uh, put in place to increase our, our ability to take on more, more effluent in, from the community. We are currently having some slight complications with our hydraulic grade line through the facility. Uh, had the engineer out yesterday. We're looking at hydraulic lines. It's, it's uh, yeah, anyway, uh, it's functioning, it's working. We're looking to make it what it should be. So just a little heads up, that work is continuing. I'm hoping there's a really easy fix for that. There's some theories out there that our, our filter, we went with a fairly aggressive filter to get our numbers down. And maybe that's backing things up into our uh, earlier lagoons. And so they're not, danger of overflowing or anything but they're higher than we like them so we're, we're looking to just work that out so that we have some free board to play with before long weekends so i'll keep you posted uh, we have an rfp out for an electric vehicle that closes on friday to date we don't have any submissions that have come in i'm not sure if it'll be like other rfps where we get a slew of them on the last day at four o'clock or uh maybe there's not a lot of electric vehicles around right now i don't know but I'll uh, keep you posted. It's Friday that closes. Uh, the crane truck that we discussed through the finance meetings, it arrived to our yard yesterday. Uh, it'll be coming before council later, uh, later in the program. Uh, the 72 inch mower, the RFP closed and we're working through details with John Deere right now. Um, so we had budgeted a certain amount uh, on a 72 inch mower. The amount was a little bit more than we'd expected, but we've got, uh, we've got, a, we've got a return. We've got the old hustler that we're gonna trade in and we're, we're trying to work them and get it where we need it to be. So that's coming. Tennis courts got paved last week. Uh, and then we got the line painter there. He did pickleball and he did tennis. So uh, yeah, so this surface looks really, really good. Uh, we do have some fence restoration to do because on the, 
on the side by the Telus building, there was all kinds of trees coming through that fence. And so it actually had to be ripped out of there. We couldn't really salvage any of it. Uh, so we're, we're lining that work up to get the fence back in. And uh, yeah, I think Jason's gonna meet with the school and talk about a possible uh, basketball net or two or something. So uh, Young Street, we've done a bit of work there last week. We've had some real drainage issues through Young Street over the course of the last few years. Uh, we've reset a catch basin at the corner, at the far corner of, of Young Street by Main Street Landing. We've put in another couple catch basins to help pick that up and take it down. We had to actually put a line in to do that. Uh, finding sewer pipe, and we needed nine sticks of pipe and not easy, it's not easy getting pipe. So anyway, we got it, it's in, it's prepped. Uh, I'm happy with how the profile looks. They'll be paving it tomorrow, they just called me and. They were supposed to be done Friday, they're gonna do it tomorrow. So that'll be one off, off our list. Uh, Kerr Road Culvert, we're still planning for August. We've had challenges with DFO. I think I've shared a few of those problems. They're really difficult to deal with. And if anybody wants some incredible reading and it's short, it's a couple of pages, but the level of detail and just, it's so onerous what these governance bodies are asking for now it's it's amazing uh, but we're working through that stuff we we've had to get an environmental specialist to help us work through that he's, you know he's got fish studies in one hand and he's got uh, a 200 year flood plus climate change on top so 220 year storm event it has to handle it's, it's yeah it's i've never seen it quite so complex but we're, we're pushing through that. We need to get that culvert done. So that's long and short of it. Uh, Beach Park, the work continues. We're trying to do as much as we can in-house. Uh, so we've had our crews out there. Public Works has been great about, uh, you know, doing some, some of the landscaping, the irrigation works. We've got a vault to replace and a few heads to fix. Um, the trail through the Beach Park, if you haven't noticed, has been raised and paved. And uh, yeah, it looks really good. We've had some good, good feedback on that. Um, but it's shouldered now and uh, seated. And we will put, we will put some turf in places where, where there's wider strips of shouldering. Uh, so we have a little more landscape. You, I mentioned earlier uh, that we've got Saskia there today putting the base in for their artwork. So that's coming. Um, yeah, uh, we have a railing, I think. They'd called to get in today. We dropped the chain for them. I think they're putting the railing up and off today. So it's another piece. So next will be the playground installation, the volleyball courts. We've got some planter ideas and some flowers and finishing touches and some painting. So it's coming, but yeah, it's good for capital. Carol, sounds like uh, good work. Uh, Councilor Anderson, questions? Thanks, Daryl. You're busy. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the have we seen a picture of the artwork for the beach park? I can't, I don't think I've seen a picture of it. What is it? I wouldn't do it justice by describing it. <laughs> it's it's, <laughs> an it's an apple. It's apples. Apples. Apples with uh, concrete with glass. It's kind of got a you're not doing it justice. No, you're not. I, you, know, you know what? This is my head in my head. And my next question for you is, are the washrooms at the beach park now open? Uh, through the chair, and I probably should have mentioned that. They have been open for the last couple of weeks. There's a sign on the washrooms right now saying closed due to vandalism. So I'm waiting for some parts to come in. We had a handicapped stall, had the door ripped off it. We had a couple other things. Ooh, and so, really, so, already just, yeah. just opened it. Two weeks. Yeah. Where's our bylaw guy? Yeah. We have cameras. We there. will come up with the strategy. I, you know, I've thought about the camera thing. You know, <clears throat> well, we can't put a camera in the bathroom, and it's just. Yeah, you. It's just That's cool, circumstantial. If you got somebody coming out, right? So it's tough to prove. Not saying inside the building, but open. No. Uh, yeah, I can't believe it. Go ahead, Colin. I agree, and I think that cameras outside the building are probably going to be your hot, your your go to, because I mean we're not going to start locking up the washrooms so people can't use them because of 
the actions of a few. I think at night we may need to lock that one. There's the Kwanzaa, it's another one we've had to. It's, it's the only one in town right now. But if they're not playing baseball, that it's locked at night. Otherwise, it just invited okay. stuff. So, I mean, we can, we'll work something out so it's reasonable, whether it's 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. We'll figure out how to lock it and leave it with us. All right, Mark, question. Go ahead, Court. Excuse me, Chair. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dara, for all the hard work your team's putting in. I'm um, just, can you, do you mind sending me that fisheries uh, letter, that two page letter? Okay, sure. Sure. Officer McCain. I'd like to thank the operating staff for uh, fixing up 417 and 425 Main, just sort of, uh, you know, giving a nice little uh, back dressing. So, uh, so we're setting the bar for other property owners in the community, and, and nice job, and thank you. I'll pass that on. Thank you. Councilor Mollis. Uh, through the chair. Yeah, good job, Daryl. Uh, but I've been asked about nine times, what's the square wood frame over there for? 417. What, what, where? Two store. Operation flat. There's the big nut box. There's timber I thought, oh, yeah, keep my. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, through the chair. So there's a surprise coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll be a community community garden. So we're going to have some plots that people can stake, own, and maintain. Uh, it's just in the growing stages right now. We're just building it. So Deb's in charge? I, I, Deb has a lot going on. <laughs> we're going to try to get this streamlined as we can. <laughs> All right, good job, Daryl. Got lots going on. Any other comments? All right, we'll carry on. Uh, community services. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with, um, I think I mentioned the council before, but um, last Monday, uh, we did a, a houseboat trip. Um, Twin Acres donated a houseboat for us to take out the uh, Spot Sheen uh, Recreation Program kids and our kids out together. So uh, 10, 10 kids from each group went out um, to look at the pictographs. Um, we were accompanied um, by Elder Gloria Morgan, um, who shared um, the language, some, some language skills in the boat. She did a, a drumming circle to tra traditional stories. We did a lunch with them. Um, so the most part was there was uh, a lot of learning uh, done, especially in the pictographs. Uh, uh, Gloria brought um, some um, interpretive uh, pieces of paper for the kids to be able to the rocks and the pictographs and actually interpret what was happening there. So that was actually really received well by both. Um, but, but the biggest thing was watching the two groups of kids interact. Um, with one another and start off with two separate groups and end up by the end of the day best friends pretty much. So we're going to continue on that, that on uh, moving into the future. We have other other things planned with them. Uh, we're going to utilize their, their transportation that they have in terms of their bus system and and, uh, and our, our groups and what resources we have and we're going to keep this going. Um, uh, but what better way to, to start the reconciliation processes with the kids, with the youth and start them off. So uh, very, 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 very successful. Um, continue to do it. Very inexpensive, again, thanks to Twin Anchors for, for, the, for the houseboat and moving forward. Um, also last week on Thursday, we held our consultation cafes, um, public consultations for, for the public, um, both at the senior center and here in this room. Uh, in the afternoon, went very well. We had about 15 to 20 people come in there and provide us feedback. I will be compiling that feedback and providing it uh, for council and for the public to see uh, as well. Evening, we had one here in the room, not as well attended because the skies opened up that night, uh, as you might remember last week, and we had a monsoon. Um, so we did have a few people come out and brave the weather, but for the most part, it was probably not as well attended as we expected. Some of the people that said they were going to come were scared off by the weather. But nonetheless, we got some great feedback um, that we're going to use to move forward um, with that. Everything from ideas and pro programming, from locations, to uh, other things that we can do to assist the community in, in, in a whole bunch of different ways. And I'll provide that feedback to you. Um, we've been, it's been a huge planning month for us. Um, now that I've got my feet firmly underneath me here, we're working towards our summer guide release on June 1st. Um, I'm also working on an event guide that I shared with the management uh, team this last weekend. We're mo modeling it after a Penticton event guide um, that will give a process for people that are applying for any kind of events in town. Um, it'll be a, a, something they can pick up and they can follow along a step-by-step -step process as to what needs to be done. So a lot of the things that council has been dealing with over the last few weeks in terms of how, in terms of how individuals come into town and are, apply to do community events should be taken care of by this, this, this guide. So uh, I, I'm hoping to have that out sometime in June, but a lot of it is, has to do with the, uh, 
the, the professional look that we wanted to have in the end that I may personally not be able to develop. So I may, may need some assistance with that, but, that, but those are all coming. Um, we have a lot of new programming this summer coming to the guide. I won't introduce that yet, so I wanna, I wanna leave that for the, the next time. Um, uh, but uh, Canada Day planning and the other events planning is, is ongoing. Canada Day is pretty much planned now for the most part. Um, we've got everybody from the entertainers to the food, to the fireworks, to the other community events all planned and ready to go. So it'll look a little bit different than it has in the past, especially as being held primarily at Beach Park. Um, so we won't utilize the other areas of town so much. So much uh, and we are, it's kind of turning into, because uh, Canada Day this year, this year falls on a Friday, some of the things that would normally happen um, because it's almost a weekend are gonna be happening the next Saturday. So it's almost like a Canada Day weekend. There's almost two days, Friday, Saturday. There's a lot of events happening on both days, including a car show um, that'll be happening on the Saturday, the, the pancake breakfast moved to the Saturday as far as that goes. So it's almost two days of events going on. So it should be re really exciting for the community. Um, in terms of the facilities, uh, it's ongoing, um, but that type of stuff, a couple of RFPs that we've been looking at for security, things that we need to look at for those buildings. Um, we have made our changeover at the curling rink. Um, curling is out for the season and pickleball has moved in. Uh, so if anybody out there is interested in playing pickleball, um, I suggest you look up the Sycamus Pickleball Club on their Facebook page. Uh, and that's where they're, they're gathering all the people right now. And of course, as Daryl said, the Lions and the tennis courts next to the high school are also uh, in pickleball as well. So we have tennis and pickleball happening out there. We've already seen the high school kids, uh, or at least seen the high school kids out there using playing pickleball. So they're already use, utilizing them the day after the Lions were painted. So clearly, clearly was wanted. And as Daryl mentioned, I'll be meeting with the, the high school principal and a couple others in terms of putting some potential basketball um, hoops up in there as well to basically make it a, a triple set a threat for what we can use that, that space for. Um, in terms of um, fire, um, uh, the chief is here, he'll be talking about the fire truck shortly, but I just also wanted to bring up that uh, obviously as everybody knows, we've been highly involved in the Wiseman Creek, um, the alert that came out last week and it was taken off on Monday whatever else, so, so busy with that, tracking that. I think most of the senior staff had their phones, especially late, late last week. Um, watching pretty closely until late the rest of the night as we were getting those major those major storms, but um, that bypassed us luckily for the for the, this time, whatever else and we'll continue on to the future. So that's pretty much it for me today. If any questions. Anderson, go ahead. <laughs> Jason, great job. I just want to make a comment. I was there when you guys got back off the houseboat with yeah. the kids. And those kids were so pumped and yelling and screaming. And they, that was a, a great day for them. And I'm glad that you're going to continue with that program because I think it's it's wonderful. Um, do we have an August uh, count <coughs> barbecue? Is that on the is, is that it on the radar? Usually August long weekend. Do we not have for the family day? Half and <clears throat> yeah, I think correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we are going ahead with that awesome. this year. And um, just my last point, did you, is there a plan for the girling club? Like you were going to meet with them after the last meeting and <laughs> you know, to, 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 to help them fund, fundraise and, and take care of some of their finances and help them with. Correct. I've, I've spoken to them. We haven't made that meeting yet. They're off doing things that they do at the end of the season now, as far as that goes. But yeah, we will be meeting with them and that and I'll get everybody involved at that point when we get it arranged, so. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Other comments or questions? Gordon? Yeah, uh, good work there, Jason. Uh, you got lots on the go. Lots on the go. <coughs> uh, I was gonna ask, I just noticed that I just got back last night, but I just checked the uh, webcam at the, at the, the, the Sycamus uh, Snowmobile Club's webcam. They just got it up and running again, and it's been down for quite a while. But uh, there's more snow up there this uh, now than there has been all year. And it's still snowing up there, so it's it's, it's at seven feet right now. So it's a lot of snow starting to come down. So, you know, just to be cautious. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Any other comments or questions? Good work, Jason. Lots going on. Keep her up. <clears throat> All right. Next, um, bylaw enforcement, John. Mr. Mayor, Council. Um, as you can see by my report, that we've had several uh, complaints in regards to animal control. Uh, with the adoption of the new bylaw, I think it's really broad. 
<clears throat> animal control of dogs and cats, so, et cetera, uh, to people's minds. Um, we're focusing our Did You Know campaign this month on the animal control bylaw. Uh, we've been doing with lots of talking with people on the side of the road. Um, and there's lots of feedback coming out on Facebook about it, uh, some negative, unfortunately, but uh, it, it's, it should be a, a fairly uh, well-rounded by a lot easier to enforce and maintain some control of these uh, problem animals. All right. Any questions? Any questions? Go ahead, Bob. I, I apologize, maybe I jumped the gun. Did through the chair, did you want to keep talking about traffic violations before asking the question? <laughs> um, traffic violations are ongoing. It's uh, whenever I'm out there, I'm watching for them. Uh, if I see something, I'm either ticketing or if the driver's around, uh, giving verbal or warnings is required. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. <laughs> to clarify, um, have you given any tickets out to uh, big trucks that are parked across the highway from Jim Hortons? Because that's happening on an ongoing basis. Yes, I have given some tickets to them. I've also given written warnings. Uh, one got a verbal warning because he started to drive away uh, as I pulled up without <laughs> exiting his vehicle. But, uh, the, it, it's going to be an ongoing problem. And as I say, when I'm out there, if I see them, I am stopping and, and dealing with them. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes, for our, thank you for our new animal uh, bylaw control bylaw. Um, we're, we're we're going heavy on uh, awareness and education as opposed to enforcement, right? Sure, sure absolutely. Uh, education and um, uh, is our primary goal with all bylaw enforcement. Uh, I, I prefer to educate and inform the public. Um, we get some voluntary compliance. Um, Take it as a last resort. Thank you. Thanks. Councilor Malmas. Uh, through the chair, uh, John, I think I asked this the last time. I don't remember the date because, you know, I need to be involved in this Alzheimer's thing. So, um, when are they going to paint the fire lane in the Tim Hortons? Through the chair, I have uh, hand delivered a letter to the management of Tim Hortons. Um, requesting a firm timeline uh, with my limited hours at the moment. I haven't been able to get that there and actually discuss it in person with them, uh, but that is on my schedule again uh, to do early next week. Thank you. Thanks, John. Any other comments or questions? All right, John, keep Thanks, up the good work. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Building and development, Scott, you're up. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in front of you or on the screen is uh, the current planning applications, uh, just working through those, some of the ones that are hanging on at the top and other ones that will council will consider tonight. Um, we have a couple more that came in last week, early this week to add to that. Um, that 110 wet up, they've actually pulled that one. So we'll, we'll remove that. But uh, yeah, any questions on the, the planning applications? I can answer those. How much of questions? All right. I'm sure Malmus, any comments? Oh, uh, well, uh, just for the public here, because at the Planning and Development Committee, we see that we have uh, more building permits coming in. And, and one of the issues with certain timelines for the contractors is building inspection. And so uh, Scott has suggested that he's going to. <laughs> to to find out. Apparently, we only have a building inspector two days a week. I thought we had a part time and training guy that was kind of dedicated to our community. So I don't know what happened with that. So I've asked Scott to review it so that the time, the just certain things like rebar concrete and a couple other instances where it's kind of timely to get the inspections done. So all right, thanks for that. All right, um, moving on to the next part of the agenda. Uh, I think that our delegation has arrived, uh, Patrick Vance, in regards to the Alzheimer's uh, program. Uh, yeah, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, Council, members of the staff, and uh, public who are here in the public. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your flexibility. I had a little bit of difficulty arriving here. 
visit west and part of Tiger Rod in there and uh, had an unplanned traffic stop there. So uh, thank you for uh, juggling with the schedule somewhat. Uh, I am the chair of the uh, North Okanagan IG Wealth Management Block for Alzheimer's 2022. My name is Patrick Vance. Uh, we rebranded it this year to the North Okanagan Walk. It was previously the uh, Greater Burn Walk and before that just the Burn Walk. But our walk actually represents nine municipalities, uh, including yours. It represents Salmon Arm, Enderby, Armstrong, Township of Small Machine, Street, <coughs> Lake Country, and Plum. Uh, it's quite an expansive reach that our little committee uh, covers, and our fundraising efforts are uh, designed to uh, fund programs and services that uh, offer are offered to uh, anyone experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's or uh, friends, family, and caregivers of those people. Uh, the first uh, slide, just to focus on one thing, uh, currently we're looking at about 70,000 people are, are estimated to be suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia in BC, and that number is expected to double in the next 10 to 12 years. Uh, so our committee felt that we were tasked with uh, developing a long-term strategy to uh, address the emerging needs of people who are in this journey. On the next slide, uh, the number 70 comes up again because that is the percentage of funding that is uh, generated by community contributions. So our fundraising efforts are very important to help uh, deliver these services. Uh, we hit the slide five. Uh, there'll be a mention there about the honoree family. This year, our honoree family uh, is Wally and Marilyn Gerard, residents of uh, Vernon. Uh, Wally suffers from frontotemporal dementia. It's not Alzheimer's. We commonly use Alzheimer's and dementia interchangeably, but Alzheimer's is only the most prevalent uh, form of dementia. Uh, frontotemporal dementia, in Wally's case, uh, presented with uh, mood regulation issues, anger management issues, and symptoms of depression. And the first place they noticed that was in his home and his relationship with his wife began to change and until they connected with some sort of medical support it was a very confusing time uh, for both him and for his wife he was suddenly the object of hostility and we didn't know why and we choose an honorary family every year to, to put a personal face on the struggles that people uh, negotiate in trying to just come to acceptance uh, that this is a this is something that when it happens it changes the course of your life forever and those around you. On the next page, uh, you'll see the uh, the two requests that our committee has posed to the district of uh, Sigamus. Uh, the first one is the golden challenge. This was our committee's way of acknowledging that. The pandemic has changed a lot of things for a lot of people. We don't know what that impact is for, for every resident in our region. Uh, that impact can be financial, it can be uh, emotional or, or otherwise. So our formula for raising funds has changed. We can't simply hold up the hat, as it were, and ask for funds. We needed to reduce the barrier to participation and find other ways that we would be able to ensure that anybody who has an interest in changing the situation has a, an ability to meaningfully engage and participate uh, with the Block for All Center. The challenge is to enroll 50% or more of your organization as participants in the Block. And enrolling as a participant does not necessarily mean that you have to physically attend the Block or even donate money. Of course, donations and participation are important, but participating also means that you connect with the Alzheimer's Society of BC. You learn about the services that the Alzheimer's Society of BC offers, such as First Link, which is a toll-free number for anybody to call if you feel that maybe you are beginning your journey with dementia, or you have friends or family or loved ones who are beginning their journey, and you need a place to start to seek solutions or to problem solve or just start that conversation. And the other program that is offered is Minds in Motion. And that's, in a, that's a program that the Alzheimer's Society of BC staff will 
come to areas where people are experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's and get them physically moving and socializing with each other. Because one of the biggest compounding factors of dementia and Alzheimer's is isolation. We also feel that a high degree of participation and a spike in participation this year will attract notice. Decisions to fund programs in our region are made at a provincial level sometimes. And at the beginning of 2020, shortly before the pandemic, the city of Vernon embraced the Dementia Friendly Community Initiative Pilot. And this is a new approach to changing the landscape of our communities so that people beginning these journeys with dementia don't find their own homes and their own communities alienating and scary to them as they begin to encounter difficulties navigating. So this is something that the pandemic put a big side on. Alzheimer's Society in BC to deliver the program Minds in Motion while everybody was facing isolation during the pandemic was faced with a monumental task of achieving some measure of outreach to people who were now forcibly isolated by medical protocols, who were confused and had no idea why this was happening. And of course, their best, their best effort revolved around putting technology in their hands, things like iPads, ability to still correspond and communicate. But you can imagine what a challenge that was, putting technology in the hands of the least tech savvy among us. So that was a very important and costly challenge that ASEB, ASBC had to negotiate, which they did. Now we're returning to in-person Minds of Motion delivery and we're very happy to see faces again and have that interaction with the isolation. So the other half of it, you know, the fundraising is important. We do need to generate funds. So between education and, and fundraising, we also feel, that, of course, education is the wealth of knowledge, which we all intuitively get. The second ask is to please join us on May 29th at the Greater Vernon Athletics Park. I know it's a journey. I came here today to make that request in person. But I also want to clarify that if any member of your council wishes to speak and send a message of support or share any story or experience about their journey with dementia or Alzheimer's, our committee is prepared to make time on our speaking itinerary to have you send that message. And it's a very important message of support that also signals buy-in to other people in the community to get involved and support this worthy cause. Uh, that's, that's about it for me, and I am open to any questions. Thanks, Patrick. Comments or questions from Council? <laughs> Councillor Evans and Councillor Malmes. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate your passion and your heart for these folks. And uh, that's shocking to me uh, that the numbers are going to double. I, I guess we're an aging population, and that's probably part of that age. Through the chair, I would imagine so. And I also believe that more people are able to get connected. So we have more awareness of people that are, are going through these situations. But things like the pandemic sped up the timer on a lot of people's clocks. And we feel that we will be facing the repercussions of that for some time to come. But as you said, the increasing population and the aging demographic are, are going to be part of that growth curve. And what time does the event begin on Sunday the 29th? Uh, through the chair, it begins, registration begins at 11 a.m. People are welcome to come and begin congregating. And then the event itself starts at 12 a.m. We will have our speakers, uh, followed by a little uh, physical uh, stretch routine, and then uh, a ceremonial walk around the track, which is about 0.4 of a kilometer. You don't make it too uh, physically rigorous or, or exhausting, but uh, you know, there is ribbon cutting and uh, everybody walks together. Thank you. Contra Mamas. Uh, yeah, it's uh, interesting. My, my mother had dementia, my wife's mother had dementia, both of them uh, aren't on this side of the earth anymore. So uh, um, the 50% of the organization as participants. Are you referring to 50, because it says District of Sycamus Council. Are you referring to the, the seven of us 50%? Or are you referring to 50% of this entire operation? 
district of Sycamore. Through the chair, we would love a 50% of Sycamore itself <laughs> for those participants, considering that there is, there is no physical uh, requirement to attend and there is no requirement to donate funds. Of course, we welcome that, but we also we also want people to connect with the All Center Society in BC. So this specific ask is for the District of Sycamore and including staff. Registration only takes several minutes, and setting a team is as easy as assigning a name when the first person registers, and everybody else can just register through that through that team link. And I'll be happy to uh, send the actual event link uh, through email to all of you. Go ahead, Jeff. I would love, should probably go to Jason or Ben Scott. Let's <laughs> challenge that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments, Court? Yeah, through the chair, a couple of comments. Um, yeah, I would, you know, the challenge would be great if it happened in town because you get better participation and uh, you know better fundraising as, as as well. And yeah, I do same thing. I'm passionate about it. Um, I think uh, with our baby boomers and our demographics, uh, I think the federal government two weeks ago, uh, or is it the provincial government? One or the other or maybe both have recognized uh, with the demographic boost of the baby boomers we're in a big trouble with, with this. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, very important. Colleen? I just want to thank you for being here. And I, I think awareness and education is, is you know, uh, the way to go so that everybody is is in the know and understands it and isn't frightened by it or, or frightened by the person that has it in their life, their loved one. but just understands it really well. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, saying so. And I also wanted to, uh, to, to provide the comment that uh, the Alzheimer's Society of BC does offer something called a walk in a box. So if there were any will in the community to host a local event, uh, that could be uh, achieved. Um, if there were a will here to have your own uh, independent walk, that as well uh, could be achieved. It's, it's something that is, is kind of my dream to at least start with uh, having Sam and Arm host their own regional that would represent uh, Sick and Boost and possibly uh, Armstrong as well, and then to allow a more uh, focused effort. But, but right now, this, this region falls to our committee. Uh, so if any of you happen to know other people that, uh, that may also be passionate about this cause and you know, you, you can do it with three or four community members who are interested in it. And it's I'm not going to say it's easy. It's a little time consuming, but it is definitely worthwhile. And I'd, I'd love to see one in every community because I feel like there could be an honoree family uh, elevated from every community to also put that first small patch on. I like the participation concept, and I know our represent our, our recreation director is here today, and he's listening to what you have to say. I personally will be joining uh, the Vernon Athletics Park uh, uh, myself. I'll be there, so I'll register. And then we'll have a conversation with uh, council as to see whether or not uh, we can give a contribution of uh, some funds as well. So we'll have that conversation. So we'll get back to you on that. Your Worship, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, and also, thank you, everybody, for the privilege to uh, see you and share this message. Thanks, Patrick. Thank All right. Now, where are we? Okay. All right. Shufa Keeley, update to Parliament. Can you give us an update on that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to just briefly summarize this yeah, six pages into three bullets rather than going through each paragraph. Um, lots of work continues to be focused on uh, the design of the building, both exterior and interior. Um, as you know, that the building is basically scheduled to be 15,000 square feet. It's going to occupy approximately one acre of space, including parking. Um, the interior work has been led by Karen Eastland and uh, Dr. Avin Defoya who works with the stakeholders regarding both the healing component and the primary care component. Um, there's a summary of the, the meetings and the intense discussions on functionality and programming within 
the uh, square foot uh, area of the building. Again, there's going to be a community space node, there's going to be a healing node, and there's going to be a primary care node that makes up the 15,000 square feet. And it's having those three nodes work together um, in, uh, in synchronicity, if you will, making sure that it's welcoming, et cetera. In terms of the park consideration, the public has expressed concern of the loss of the park and the, and the space called 200 Main Street where it's been used as a park for the last three, four years as a, an event gathering uh, space. Um, we are committed to make this facility just that. Um, we are gonna be dedicating an acre green space. Um, we are also looking at incorporating in the design a potential um, rooftop uh, in uh, space for the community. And also with the community node, I spoke earlier about um, this building will have uh, three to 3,500 square feet dedicated to community space. This will be a large circular room that welcomes all people um, across the region to this, this wonderful facility where when you walk in, it will not have an institutional hospital medical clinic feel. It will have a field designed to be inclusive. Um, and this of course aligns with our community wellness plan and our commitment to truth and reconciliation. Um, and so it's important that we get the park right and we will be having more detailed discussions with our consulting team on that. Uh, the budgeting, uh, in short, um, right now we're trying to get to class C and just for everyone's benefit, there's, there's sort of four definitions when it comes to cost estimates on capital projects. Uh, class D estimates are you have a vision, you would like to build something, and you have a ballpark budget. And so when we submitted our grant application for 6 million, we submitted class D estimates on what roughly uh, 15,000 square feet would look like. And it's just a class D. Uh, class C, you get sort of closer to the true cost. That's a preliminary design, which is what we're at right now. So we're trying to nail down the class C as we finalize the preliminary design. And then class B is when you get to final design stage, so you've got a final design on the exterior of the interior, you're ready to go and get a cost from the market and class A being if you go to tender and you get an actual quote from a contractor to build, we will know what class A is and typically that's 10, 15% of the actual cost. To achieve that and to make sure the building is on budget, but also incorporate the design features we all seek, the park space inside the community space, the healing node, the different outside facade features, we have to do an exercise called value engineering. And a value engineer will basically make sure that the design and the budget are united because we all have wish lists, but that drives costs. Of course, I don't think anyone is unaware of the challenges with pricing today, with the supply chain issue, post COVID inflation, we know at class C, we're gonna be getting to a figure class B and class A that's gonna be higher than anticipated. And when we applied for funding back in 2018, you know, we were working with the world before COVID. So this value engineer process will try to align our wish list with our actual available dollars to build. Um, we're gonna be seeking additional capital grants to address the very thing I just talked about. There's a couple of deadlines coming up that we can assist. We're looking at some green technologies. We want to make this building as green as possible. And Clean BC does have their next intake due by the end of May. In, in, in short, and to finalize the third bullet, what we'd like to get done this summer is the geotechnical, the environmental, and the archaeological assessment on 200 Main. Um, there's a definition of the three. What we're trying to do is work with Splat Scene and their uh, caretakers of the land um, company. Uh, this trying to work with the Splat Scene Development Corporation to direct the ward, the geotechnical, the environmental, and the archaeological, working with our partners to have this site prepared as we inch closer to actual construction. Um, this weekend, uh, we have uh, Douglas Cardinal, our architect in Edmonton. Um, two representatives of Splatson, including uh, a representative from the District of Sycamus Council, will be attending those meetings. Uh, we will be have uh, intense discussions on programming and functionality of the interior. 
working with Splatsing, make sure we get the components of truth and reconciliation nailed down. Um, that will be on Sunday, May 15th. We're taking advantage of his um, visit to uh, Alberta on Saturday. Um, I don't know if you can bring it up, Kelly. I sent you an email um, on the itinerary for Saturday, which we're also going to be attending. Um, and we're going to be part of this discussion. So on Saturday, Douglas Cardinal will be in Alberta uh, hosting an event uh, talking about truth and reconciliation, um, the importance of it. And uh, we, the District of Sycamus, are going to be part of that presentation because we are doing more than just talking about truth and reconciliation. This facility is about achieving a lot of the work that is important to him. And so we have reserved four spots to attend that session on Saturday. Um, and that hopefully if there's any questions from the floor on what municipalities can do in terms of UNDRIP, in terms of um, truth and reconciliation calls to action, working with uh, First Nation partners, we will be available there to share our story alongside our architect uh, who's working on the project. And finally, you see a uh, preliminary schedule. Yeah, it's it's very uh, optimistic. I think I would personally add a couple of months to each of those proposed dates, uh, <laughs> dates that our consultant is saying we're going to look at. So our focus between uh, the end of summer is to get the geotechnical, the environmental, and the um, archaeological works done. So we're prepared to dig a hole and and, and build this this wonderful facility. Uh, that concludes my summary. I'm available to answer any questions. Um, and this will be available, of course, to the public and be updated on our website. All right. Comments or questions from council? All right. Thanks, Evan, for that update. And um, I'm pleased that we have the opportunity to go to uh, <clears throat> as well. All right. Moving on. Um, Flood mitigation and shoot up near walkway. Councillor Malmus, uh, you wanted to comment on this. <laughs> well, it's a comment with a couple of questions thrown in. So through the chair. Be nice. uh, so in that meeting that I had with Daryl, uh, to my surprise, our staff had a meeting with uh, the Ministry of Environment and Front Counter and a few others uh, about the walkway that we at the planning committee talked about doing a seawall from Finlayson through to the uh, Main Street landing. And uh, the result of the meeting was is there's not much hope of that ever happening or us ever getting permitted to do it. So although the three people along there said they would contribute to it so we would apply for grant funding so this came about because i was bugging price for seawall they'd already had a meeting saying that you know this is never going to happen that was the first that i had heard about it but you got people who need to replace their seawalls so i'd like the staff evan and scott and daryl to comment on exactly what the perception of this is, what the reality of it is. And so we can tell the people that have held off on putting it a seawall or block wall, waiting for us to come back to the result, uh, and get some direction they could proceed on their own or for participate. Evan. Yeah, the, um, you know, I've heard about this a good two months ago. Um, Having a staffer at the provincial government level tell a municipality their opinion or their take on either capital grants or projects that municipalities face, we deal with that all the time. We, we have provincial employees who say, you'll never get a community forest. You have provincial employees who say, um, you're not gonna get a tenure. Um, sometimes municipalities have to get political to achieve the goal. In this case, you simply have the opinion of staff representing the provincial government that in short, to spend 10, 20, 30 million dollars from Finlayson to Capel, protecting four condo complexes, 
five condo complexes, half a dozen small businesses is a lot of money for not a lot of property owners. And that your chances of getting funding, if we apply for capital funding, is slim to none. I mean, that was generally the comment. Um, we're not talking about 100,000 people at risk of being flooded. We're talking about a small number of people, and it's the opinion of certain staff that the chances of you receiving a sizable capital grant to basically protect those limited number of businesses and condo owners is probably slim to none. What they would like you to do is build seawalls to protect critical infrastructure, lift stations and water treatment plants and wastewater treatment facilities and other community assets that are integral to the operation of that municipality, not private property, okay? So as you know, we commissioned KWL years ago to do a study. They've come back with the study or the different options of a seawall, a pedestrian walkway. And that's the important thing too. The seawall is also a pedestrian walkway, which is important to our trail master plan to connect people throughout the community where it's not just a wall that protects from flooding. It's also a wall that has a walkway on it. Um, no different if you've been to the town of Golden recently along the Kicking Horse River, you'll see that they've done some flood mitigation works. It's also a trail. It's protecting some infrastructure, but there's very limited. So I'm not too concerned on what, what one uh, employee says. Let's wait to see when we file an application. Let's see, uh, based on the discussions with the different landowners and the different business owners, whether there's an appetite to participate. There are some business owners that don't want to see seawall or access with a walkway in front of their building. And so that's what I've heard from the, the, uh, the provincial employees. I understand it. Again, I've heard the same thing from different ministries involving provincial employees saying that, uh, you know, there's no trees, there's no fiber, you're not going to get a community forest, so don't bother. It's a political quest. You got to go and you got to lobby and you got to work around that to see if you really want to achieve a, a community forest. And we're doing that through Bill 28 which is basically the, the new initiative from the NDP government that talks about purchasing tenure from industry and then giving it back to communities. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not too concerned about what I heard. I, I think we just continue to move forward. Uh, we're working on a proponent who's looking at purchasing the three boys property. They love the seawall. They want to see the seawall. They, they don't want to have their basement, if you know the three boys property, fill up with two feet, three feet of water every spring. So they're encouraging the district to build a section from Capel heading north uh, in front of their property to protect water. And they have no problem with the public access in it either. So there are, there are some businesses and condo groups that would like to see that wall. But I know it's a long-winded answer, but I think this is how staff interpreted those meetings with the provincial folks. If Daryl and Scott want to add anything to that, um, it was no surprise to me to hear that. So the question is, is the challenge uh, the property owners along the, the channel or is the challenge uh, the DFO, the provincial government? Where's the challenge with all of this stuff? I mean, we might have some input into it, but uh, I mean, who holds the cards? I seem to think that uh, we don't seem to hold many cards when it comes to this flood mitigation seawall. We spent a lot of money already trying to do uh, some of the, uh, uh, try, trying to determine what's necessary. So uh, can you answer me that question? I, I wanna know like who holds the cards when it comes to this thing and where are we going with this? And, and we've been into this thing now for almost 10 years and it doesn't seem like we've got too much traction, although we have got some financial support uh, uh, do we continue to chase this rainbow or do we take a look at maybe other things that are more important to us? Well, all, all good questions. I mean, the, the short answer is the province holds all the cards. They're both from the regulatory regime. They issue the permits and also from the funding regime. They issue the money. We have to lobby and basically convince the province, no different than we tried to do with Wiseman Creek, is it better to spend money on recovery after a flood each year when you spend millions and millions of dollars, or is it best to just say, you know what, let's see if we can protect those businesses and water coming up Capel and, and flooding that, that lower portion where the Red Barn is in Finlayson. Let's look at a long-term, um, a proactive measure. And so 
And we have to work with the province on this. They regulate the permitting process. They regulate everything on the water and they also provide the funding. Do I think we should give up? No, but we have to convince them that our proposal is better than waiting every two, three years for Sycamus to flood. And then we submit some sizable uh, bills back to EMBC because we're trying to protect our community from getting wet. Yeah, I've always looked at the proactive approach than, rather than the reactive approach. So that almost that makes sense. Uh, Councilor Anderson, go ahead. I guess, wouldn't it be fair, Evan, to say that Sycamus, I mean, homeowners along the channel and businesses, I mean, that's a whole flood there. <clears throat> so every time we do a flood, it does affect our infrastructure somewhat. And again, I mean, maybe it's a, a different way of presentation, but every time it floods, our, our, our town, our district erodes a little bit more. So maybe that's an angle where we make it more, more urgency in it, as opposed to, yeah, we need a seawall. No, we need some way to stop the district of Zikamus from continuing to slide into the channel. Mm -hmm. So I <clears throat> might be a thought. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think when we sit down and, you know, UBCM is coming up, so we're gonna be back at the table this fall face to face. I think we should have more of a detailed discussion on what we think they should be looking at when we do apply. There is major capital grants available, both federal and provincial, to build what we need to build. But the real question is, is how much would the province give us to protect the little businesses there are? Our argument should be more like our beach park improvements. We, we've used provincial funding to build up beach park. We want to protect beach park. It is a community asset. It's not a wastewater treatment facility, but it is an enhancement that public works and our crew have done to the tune over a million dollars. We want to protect it. Maybe we need to emphasize stuff like that. And this is a community that we're- And this is a community, yeah. <clears throat> Councilor Malmus, go ahead. And I, was, I wasn't quite finished after Evan made his answer. The issue is not that. It's the issue is, is that there was a couple of proponents asked to give a price on a seawall. And as Mr. Parliament suggested that, oh, well, we, that's just a couple of staffers saying no. Uh, but when you ask a uh, contractor to give you a price to put in the seawall so you got a class c estimate so you can actually go for a grant and they were a participant in the meeting and they say there's no damn chance we're getting it so that means they're not interested in doing any legwork towards getting you a price i'm just going so where are we at like if if our staff has a meeting with other government officials and they bring along a component to it and they're all told no way and that's what they all believe and they walk away. I've gone for three and a half or four months and been asking where is our estimate for that seawall from there to there because we had this at a planning meeting and I'm finding out there's nothing going on with it because it's kind of slipped through the hole because everybody attended a meeting where they were told no. But I just found this out last week on Thursday. So I'm just, all I'm saying is, is are we going to move ahead with this or not? I don't care one way or the other, but the actual landowners in front of that proposed the seawall, the guy had the blocks and everything in place to do it. And we convinced him that he should wait until we see what we could do with this. So I think that the big thing is, is that they're entitled to an answer, yes or no. Do they put their own blocks in or do they wait for the district for 10 years to come up with a way to put in a seat? Scott, so <clears throat> one, of the, one of the proponents was ready to go yeah. and he was ready to apply for development permit and he had, he had his ducks in a row with, with uh, the province. He, I, I told him in March that, you know, you may as well go ahead and do your thing because one of the things was council say we should seek funding and we haven't found any funding that's that's a big issue is we haven't had that found that funding so i i actually told him go ahead do your wall if we have to get the funding and then we have to come back and redo his wall then that's that's the way it is but he he was told go ahead and start the process on his end um and i think yeah it's like who holds the cards well there's the funding card which is the big one um and then there's the other the other one is the ownership issue where they want a commitment that all the people along that that road or that uh 
along the, the shore there on Young Road in particular, they want a commitment that they will give up the, the required land. So that's that's the other one we'd have to look for is, is the ownership. So it's kind of like funding. And then once you get funding, we have to get ownership. And then we start that approval process through the province, but, but funding's the big one. And until we, we until that becomes available, it's, it's hard for us to give anybody advice. Although we did tell the one guy, build your wall. The other ones there who probably will have to build walls as well. <clears throat> yeah, until we have money, we can't help them. Councilor Bushel, you had a question? Yeah, no, I agree with Evan that, you know, we just, we have to keep pounding away at UBCM and we have to go to the feds too, because the feds have, you know, they have a lot more money mm -hmm. for flood mitigation than, than the, the provincial government does. And we have to, we have to keep uh, hounding uh, Mel Arnold and, and uh, our MLA, Greg Kylo, and get to UBCM. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, again, it's it's more a disappointment on my side. As the chair of the Planning and Development Committee meeting, we brought those individuals into the meeting. We had a discussion with them when the guy was making the application for the seawall. And I feel that it probably should have came back to the Planning and Development Committee meeting with those same three people in the room, and we should have told them all the same thing. Instead, staff has had a conversation with one. What about Reg Rental and what about uh, uh, the marina? Like, if we're going to do this, we went and talked to them united. We should have the same united conversation with them when we find out information. So that's the disappointing part to me. I'm, I'm the chair of the planning development committee. We brought those people in. We had the discussion. They made a commitment that they would participate. We said we would see if we could find funding. Now, Two months ago, we can't find funding, so we've informed the one guy to go ahead and build the wall. So that's the disappointment to me. It's an important project, and I see year after year being reactive and sandbagging and water dams and all the different things we put along the Ridge Channel, and it just seems to we spend money over and over and over again fruitlessly. Anyway, okay, well, we'll move on. Thanks, Mr. Malmus. Um, now we get into the strategic priorities. Um, anybody want to comment on any of the strategic priorities at this stage? Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, to do with the rail trail, uh, uh, the mayor and I went on a trail ride with uh, Dad Thompson, Coopy, and uh, Graham Go, who's the Splats of Development Corporation. Uh, CEO, and uh, we stopped at the different docks, the ones that are built, the ones that are waiting to get built, the one that has a ramp at the end of it that folds up, and docks along the way. We stopped at our, our three where the border of it is, both ends of it. They, they looked at the guys who'd built the walkway down from the road, across the ditch with little lights on it and everything to get to the boats that are moored there. It was suggested, you know, maybe they should come up with a crossing agreement to uh, get some revenue from those people. That was the mayor's idea. And uh, we went the whole trail and stopped at a lot of different places. Uh, we stopped at uh, Grid Rod and had lunch. And then we came back and then uh, we had a little walk around town and pointed out a few things that are going on in town here. So I don't know, I'd like the mayor to comment on, but I thought it was a very good meeting that we've exposed them to the idea of the community forest and that the trail could have these kiosks on it based on our friendship accord and available funding from the federal government on the three communities and so uh and it was mentioned which i am hoping that we could give direction to staff to uh, work towards setting up a council to council a full council to council council meeting. Uh, and that was suggested by them that the three groups get back together again. So uh, if, but somebody has to initiate it. So if our staff could initiate setting this up, but all seven of us, all seven of Enderby and all seven of their council uh, to discuss the issues that are relative to what we're trying to all accomplish. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, go ahead, Colleen. Um, I'm going to, I'm just, we're just moving on on strategic priorities. Um, the short-term, uh, uh, regulating short-term rental and just uh, 
rentals. Um, Gordon, I met with staff. We're going to try and streamline this a little bit more, make it a bit simpler before we bring it to council. It is um, on our portfolio, and I think that it's kind of got it kind of got pushed into the planning committee. So now we're going to kind of round it up and put it back in our portfolio and work with Scott and the team to see what we can come up with. And that's in the bylaws that's come. They're coming up, but for this year, um, I think it's safe to say, I think it's safe for all of us to say that short-term rentals will roll out as they are. Um, there's nothing that we can change or do for this year, but moving into next year, um, probably by the end of the summer, we'll have some, maybe some definite direction for 2023. So stay tuned. Thank you. Any other, any other uh, comments on uh, strategic priorities? All right, thank you for that. Uh, um, <coughs> Councillor's reports. Mr. Bushley, you've been away for a little while, but uh, you're up. I really don't have nothing to report. I just got back late last night, so I, I've been gone for two weeks. All right, thank you. Councillor Anderson. Um, just a couple of things. I went out with one of the guys from the ECDEV Corp, and we showed, uh, we have a, a guitar manufacturer that's interested in, in coming to Sycamus. So, uh, we went out on a Sunday and showed him a couple pieces of property. So who knows, fingers crossed that we found some space for him. I attended the bioheat uh, ceremony and that was very well done. Staff and Mayor and um, Chief and Mel Arnold um, did a, a great job. That was, uh, that's pretty exciting for the district of St. Uh, we attended the special council meeting where the mayor broke the tie, was a tiebreaker on the son of Stomp. I um, met with uh, Councillor Evans uh, regarding the uh, Ukrainian family, and I'll let him um, talk about that a bit more. And yeah, um, that's about it for me. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor McCabe, you're up. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. So uh, attended SILGA, and as part of SILGA, signed up for a couple of workshops. One workshop was for uh, social procurement. And just a couple of bullets on that. Social procurement is is not just a, a a purchasing policy. It's 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 more than that. It brings uh, it's more than just shop local. It's it's more of a it, it makes for a, a healthy, resilient community. Uh, it, it's sixty three percent of your tax, your your money spent every dollar gets back into your community if you shop locally. It's also about ethically purchasing. You know, for services and, and uh, supplies, um, which is important these days. Uh, so, you know, you're not abusing third world countries and uh, for importing goods and stuff. Um, well, contracting uh, um, in our policy, we could put wording in there for uh, purchasing services and goods through uh, social procurement. Uh, you can have a community benefit agreement or uh, there's there's a provincial organization called uh, BCSBI, so British Columbia uh, Social Procurement. I think it's impact, but it might be, uh, I think it's uh, social procurement impact. Sure. So I suggested to Jen that as, as a community, we sign up to that uh, association. I think it's well. 375 bucks a year, something like that. And what they can provide us is um, templates, uh, Word documents, training for staff on uh, for free. All this is for free if you're a member. The membership is pretty cheap. I think it's something that we'll evolve into, so might as well try and uh, get in front of it. And uh, I, I think it's it, it's about hiring local and making sure that other business down uh, and then they're a little bitter. You wait their contract of how much local hire they're going to do and how much local services they're going to try and, and utilize. Um, so that was interesting. Did another workshop called uh, This Just In. This Just In. <laughs> oh, that's just an example. Uh, uh, seven units of affordable housing, uh, TD structures, local jobs. That's you know, like for our housing, this is our uh, 
work, working vision statement for housing, the vision of the Sycamus Affordable Housing Society is to address the housing needs and gaps identified in housing needs assessment towards ensuring residents of Sycamus <coughs> can secure safe, appropriate, and affordable housing that meets their needs. Affordable housing is essential for a community to be socially and economically sustainable. So socially and economically, that rolls right in with social procurement. The, the Sycamus community will work together towards creating an inclusive community that facilitates the development of diverse and appropriate housing options for people of all ages, abilities, and income. So it, it's not just getting a low bidder, it's getting the best value for your money. And your best value is not always your, your lowest bid. Then I did another uh, workshop about turning when into now, and that's, their acronym was IPD, and IPD is Integrated Project Development. It's a different way of develop or, or uh, implementing projects. So, and, and it rolls in nicely with uh, social procurement. So at the front end of this process, uh, it's called the validation process where you sit down as a group of all the stakeholders who are gonna be involved and you, and you discuss um, what it is that you're trying to... A little bit louder, please. How many more pages you got? Uh, <laughs> it discusses about uh, what it is you're trying to deliver and, uh, and, and do you have enough money to deliver that? And through that validation process, there's a, a go, no go decision. And then then all the, all the people involved in delivering that project sign a contract. And part of that contract is just not a, a lump sum contract. It's, a, it's sort of like a social procurement contract also where uh, one of the things they sign off on is that they're not gonna sue each other or, or the person they're working for or their supplier. And, and so uh, in this process, the city of Canlips is a good example of this. They, they've been doing this for quite a few years. They, they, they deliver all their uh, projects ahead of schedule and under budget. They've never gone over budget on a, on, a, on a tax dollar project. So, and then it suggests to staff that they might want to reach out to Kamloops and see how they, uh, how they tender out some of their contracts. Sorry for rambling. So it did still so um, um I give staff an interior health guide that was handed out for each different area at Silgo. So Anita is our interior health rep and, and she um, had a survey analysis just for our, our seminar in the interview area and how to be a, a more healthy or more community wellness uh, sort of community. So I give that out to Scott, but that could be shared with uh, Jason and, and, and their, all, all our staff and, and suggestions from data from the survey and how to be more, uh, for our community more uh, healthy. Um, I attended the planning committee this morning, uh, the special council meeting the other day, last week. And again, I wanna mention the staff about, uh, thank you for cleaning up 417 and 425. It just took a day's work, I think, I believe, and maybe a day and a half or whatever with our own in-house services. It didn't cost any extra taxpayer money and, and it sets, sets an example how we like to see vacant property left in our community. So we have to lead by example. So we'll like to thank Daryl staff for doing that. And that's what it. Thank Councillor McCabe. Uh, Councillor Aries. Oh, thank you. Um, I attended uh, some parts of Silk as well. The uh, groundbreaking for our uh, bioheat system. Um, so we got a tour of uh, Zest just uh, yesterday or the day before a few of us, incredible facility in uh, Salmon Arm and uh, had the community cleanup just a couple of weeks ago. That's all the detail I think we need. <laughs> <laughs> the rest is top secret. <laughs> it's top secret because of actions by a town floor, I guess. Uh, we did the spring clean up. It was well attended. I think there was 40 at the spring cleanup, and how many did you have at the seniors? Another dozen? 
And the, and the Legion was very generous and provided a lunch for the participants. Uh, so, you know, we'll start with Kelly and Evan were there, and of course, Deb Heath and uh, Jason, uh, Daryl, Scott, Ryan, myself, the mayor. I, no, you, no, I, oh. nobody over there that was there. Oh, yeah, you were there in the morning, sorry. <laughs> Um, but there was kids that were working at the parks. And so, uh, as we said, we went into the, uh, nature thing. We got about a ton and a half, 3000, almost 3000 kilograms of lumber off the trails out of there. And then we, uh, the, the people did the streets and, and they got about another 500 kilograms of garbage off the. 97 of that in the parks and so it was a it was a good turnout and uh everybody enjoyed it it's it's kind of like it's like a social now i guess is what you call it because they they get together there's certain people want to walk with certain people and but no the community looks good and thank you very much for everybody that helped out with it so uh, we had the planning meeting again today that uh, you can think it's recorded you can watch that online it's going on in our community so yeah it's all good thanks Evans. thank you um so i met with some the folks who are running our daycare in town talking about how we can make that better and it's uh it's starting to pick up and uh it will be full by the time summer comes around because they get a lot of kids from out of town that are, are visiting for a while using our facility. I went to the uh, high school PAC meeting last week and uh, talked about our high school and, and how things are going there. It's uh, recovering well from, from the pandemic and uh, kids are loving spring and uh, the teachers will love it a little less once they get stir crazy because they see the weather's good outside. <laughs> But uh, we, we found out Monday that, um, that we're sad to see Mr. Mark Marino go after our five good years as our principal. He's done a lot of good for the school, but there's been a school board shuffle as there is every five, seven years. And uh, that's the segue to the next part that as principal, he'll be welcoming a new student from the Ukraine. Um, this, uh, this team will be part of a family that's coming to Sycamus. And at the beginning of June, so they'll have about a month to adjust to being part of the school. And I'm sure all the kids uh, will do a good job of making him feel at home as possible. He had to leave his dad in the Ukraine. And he's here with his mom. And um, it, as a town, we have an opportunity, and I've already met with uh, Councillor Anderson and some other people in town that want to form a um, a committee of sorts that will help as they arrive with not much more than backpacks. And um, they arrive early in June, working on details for the arrival, but we know the basics starting them off will be um, providing them the means to buy clothing and uh, groceries. And, and uh, initially they have a place to live, but it won't be tenable for long-term solutions. So we're looking at options for long-term housing for them, which we all know is hard to come by and that's why that is important. Um, but we are looking at options like possible landowners who are maybe provide land to maybe put a, a temporary micro home on or something like that to help them. We're working on those details. There's a lot of homework to do, um, but we are getting a family from the Ukraine. And it's a chance for our town to step up and, and welcome these folks. And uh, I'm open to having coffee with you if you'd like to know how you can help. Thank you. Well, I think all the counselors pretty much covered everything that I've been involved with over the last uh, three, four weeks. Uh, but I want to uh, comment on the spring cleanup and the um, young people that came out to help. I don't know, there was probably 10 or so. And, uh, and it was really nice to see those kids come out and uh, they were out there and they were picking up garbage and they were putting it in. And I was like, that was very cool to see that. So yeah, uh, I want to thank Jeff and uh, Deb for their work on the spring cleanup and and Deb for putting me uh, over there by the red barn looking after all those weeds. <laughs> but
but we got it done. Um, so um, Silga, uh, one thing that came out of Silga for me was a really good meeting with Fortis in regards to this um, uh, opportunity for us to bring natural gas to Sycamus and uh, and uh, they're really keen on making it still work. So uh, I was really impressed with that particular meeting as well. Uh, the meeting that we had with uh, Doug Thomas and Graham Gole on the rail corridor, I th thought was a really, really good meeting. It was nice to take them out onto the rail corridor this time of year prior to the growth coming in onto the corridor and where you could actually go along the corridor and you could actually see from both sides of it and see the, uh, the dynamics that the rail corridor um, kind of was throwing at us. And, uh, and we explained to them what our position was on it. And I think that they were listening and, uh, and uh, we had a great conversation with them and we'll see where that goes. Um, apart from that, um, uh, that's pretty much it. Pretty much everything was already discussed by the rest of the councillors. So with that being said, uh, we have a few minutes allotted for public input. Uh, do we have uh, any hands up at this stage? Or uh, just, just If anyone wishes to address council online, now is your time. You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. All right, we don't see any hands up. Yeah, and then you and Paul. Yeah, just real quick, reiterating big thanks to everybody for the community cleanup. And I just want to give a special shout out um, to the Bible Church. Last three years, they've gone over with seniors' beds. That is really, really hard work. And they're just like one through that and pickleball guys coming out. Um, I just want to mention too, if anybody's wondering why nothing's getting planted, the weather's freaking weird right now. So I am the, it's, I've got stuff. I'm going to get it planted. Bunker Fields donated for the Green Game Garden. I'm going to get it in. It's just really kind of crazy cool to do. So it's happening. Right. And a big shout out goes to Brian too for his input when it comes to the spring cleanup as well. He's uh, always been very involved. You wouldn't happen to be tomorrow, would you? I am. Okay, so we got you on here as a delegation so you can have the podium and you can present yourself. So we're, we're giving you more than two minutes. My name is Tamara Lockhart. I live in the Dollar Store in town. Um, my family history is actually very Ukrainian and my dad came when he was 10 years old, and our family came because they were sponsored by a family in Canada, or they couldn't have come. Um, so with that being said, I didn't realize that you are possibly sponsoring a family to come to Sycamore. Is that correct? Did I understand no. to the Bible? No, 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 not officially. We're just in the stages of uh, folks in town okay. that would like to to help out with that. So I've already uh, started a fundraiser that I had looked into the fact that Kamloops um, Immigrant, Immigrant Services is bringing families to Canada. Um, so I've already started a fundraiser um, to possibly pass on to them. That's what I've put on social media so far. But if a family does come here, we can switch that and have it stay locally. Well, of coffee. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Um, so my request is, I've already got um, some of the elementary classes, um, the two preschools and the after school club planting sunflowers. I've donated sunflower seeds to them and some of them need the supplies to plant them, some don't. Um, so I was wondering if you would be willing to let us plant them along the walking trail on high, Highway 97 um, from Capel. Sorry, I can't remember the name of the street that the police station's on in the Paradise. Okay. Yes, yes. So along there, but um, right against the trees facing the road, not into the um, trail, just because they need the sun and also um, so they're visible. Just we have, I, I know that we have a lot of Ukrainian um, heritage in, around Sycamore's. And just with those families coming to Canada, it'd be nice to show support to them. Um, 
Deb has already offered with me to help plant them. The one downside to that is that sunflowers do have a really big stem. They can just be cut off at the ground in the fall. They aren't drought tolerant. You don't need to water them, but it's going to take a little bit of work to cut them down in the fall because they would be a mess laying there. Um, yeah. I think uh, based on the fact that we have Deb here in, in charge of communities in Bloom, we got Daryl Public Works here and why not, we'll pass you on to those two particular people. You can have that conversation with them. If it fits into the wheelhouse, then they'll give you a little bit of direction and probably some support. And so that's the two people that you probably would like to uh, have a conversation with. I just wanted to ask if it was a problem for children, like if they went out to plant the sunflowers as long as that's okay with the teachers, is that a problem with the district at all since that's district land? Like, is that a risk or a danger? Like if the teachers were okay with it, I assume it would be older classrooms so and not young ones, but is there any problem with that? I think that trails on um, the, the highways right away. So it doesn't belong to the district, but that, that trail is under Permit, I believe, Daryl. Yeah, I, I guess just from a maintenance perspective, we do mow that boulevard, so it would be nice to know when you guys plan to do that. Yeah, we can give our guys a heads up. I would suggest to put it into the trees, not really on the grass, just on the trees. Closest to the trees. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There could be some complication, but we'll get you on the right track. Colleen, you want to comment? Um, yeah, Tamara, I think this is a great idea, and I love it. Um, and I think that if the kids are supervised, if you've got teachers or parents with them, I think I, I, yeah. I don't think that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll present that to them if they want to get a parent or not. And if not, you know, definitely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay about cutting them down in the fall. You can help with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Gord. Thanks, Tamara. Gord. Yeah. Gord. Yeah. Thank you. Gord. Okay, Gord, go ahead. <laughs> Tamara, just one quick one. Um, I know I just I've been away for a couple of weeks. I noticed you got a uh, like uh, up there. Do you sell them there? Yeah, we're selling them as a fundraiser. So I have a supplier of them. I have to purchase them on yep. Amazon. Yep. But we're also selling the little flags in the store. And my fundraiser at the Legion's first market was just to sell seedlings because I, I don't know how to grow them. I thought it was something everyone would maybe buy. Yeah. And so far, we're sitting at seven hundred fifty dollars. Sure. My goal was possibly twenty two hundred to pay for a flight for someone to come from the Ukraine. Great, thank you very much for everything you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Other you know, Ukrainian in the uh, council chambers. You very never much. have too many Ukrainians. That's what I always say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mara Heights hydraulic mapping when it comes to BC timber sales. Uh, do we have a representative from, from so Grace? BC? Grace is online. He's online. Yep. Okay. All right. So what happened? Uh, we had uh, this presentation from BC. Uh, timber sales in regards to, to Two Mile, Wiseman Creek and Sycamus Creek at the CSRD board uh, at the last CSRD uh, meeting. I made uh, them, uh, uh, I asked them if they would come to Sycamus and do the very same presentation because uh, of the importance to Sycamus. And so we have them online now and you have the floor, so. We got online right now with the BC timber sales. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Grace Chalmitz, and I work for BC Timber Sales, Okanagan, Columbia. I'm here today to give you a presentation on the Two Mile Road fire proposed salvage. 
I'm joined today by some of my colleagues, uh, Warren Yablonski and Colin Langston, as well as Michael Milne of MJ Milne and Associates and Ryan Williams from Azimuth Forestry and Mapping Solutions. I'm going to talk to you today about who BCTS or BC Timber Sales Okanagan Columbia is, the current hydrological hazard. I'm going to show you some photos of current conditions as well as a map of BCTS's plans. We're going to talk about the hazard post-harvest and a summary of landslide hazard, the benefits of salvaging burnt timber, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions. So who is BC Timber Sales Okanagan Columbia or BCTS? BCTS manages 20% of the province's crown timber. We sell that timber through auctions to help determine the market value of timber harvested from public lands in BC. BCTS focuses on safe and sustainable development of crown timber on public lands. We are committed to reconciliation with indigenous peoples and we are based out of the Vernon Ministry of Forest Office with a field office in Revelstoke. So uh, current hydrological hazard. During the 2021 fire season, portions of the Wiseman and Sycamus Creek watersheds were burnt in the Two Mile Road fire. In areas that had high or very high burn severity, the hydrological function has already been impacted post fire. The current post burn hazard downslope of proposed development is estimated at moderate to high. And some of the conditions that are contributing to the high hazard rating post fire is a legacy network of non status roads and trails that were not deactivated. These trails and roads are disrupting the natural drainage patterns and impacting slope stability. Um, and a, a, um, hydrophobic soils that are present post fire, as well as very little surviving vegetation. Further landslide activity in this area is expected post fire. I'm gonna show you some photos taken in the field um, that show the current conditions. This photo is showing a failing wood box culvert on a major tributary stream to the Wiseman Creek. It has the potential to fully fail and could possibly trigger a debris flow event in this picture, where my cursor is, if you can see it, is where the box culvert is, and the stream is flowing across like this. This photo is showing a major stream diversion on a legacy non status road. The water is coming in from upslope, hitting the road, and running along the road instead of across the road. This photo is showing another major stream diversion on a legacy non-status road in one of the blocks. And just like the last one, the water is coming in from the upslope and running along the road instead of across the road. The previous photos are examples of what our professionals found during field assessments of the area. This map is showing all the concerns that they found. So looking at the map, the pink shapes with the red outline are proposed BCTS blocks. So you can see them in here and in here. Um, and the points of concern are identified on the map as points or lines with an associated number. Those numbers are shown in the table in the bottom right corner, or as I've shown on the left-hand side of the slide here and with a description of what the concern is. There are 16 total concerns, and a lot of these concerns have to do with drainage pattern disruption and failing crossings on legacy trails and roads. All these points of concern are an opportunity to make the watershed more resilient. BCTS is currently working on a plan to fix these legacy concerns within the watershed. We're able to address these concerns because of our salvage harvesting operation. So the risk post harvest. BCTS is focusing harvesting in areas that have high to very high burn severity. And as I touched on in a previous slide, 
areas with high or very high burn severity are already experiencing the hydrological effects um, and there would be essentially no net change if these areas are harvested. If all the recommendations provided by terrain and hydrology professional assessments are implemented, the residual hazard to the Sycamus Creek Mobile Home Park and Highway 97A associated with the proposed harvest, uh, salvage harvesting operation, it will be managed to low. So this table is showing a summary of the landslide hazard. On the left-hand column is the name of our blocks here. And in the second column is the post wildfire landslide likelihood. This shows the risk within the block as well as downslope of the block. The data in this column, it was generated with the assumption that no salvage harvesting or drainage restoration works would occur within the study area. As you can see, downslope of each of the blocks is either moderate or high. And the the far right column is showing post-harvest landslide likelihood. It also shows within the block as well as downslope of the block. And this, the data in this column was predicated on the implementation of all recommendations included in the terrain and hydrology assessment, as well as implementation of a drainage restoration plan within the study area. As you can see, the downslope hazard has been reduced to low or low to moderate. And I just wanna note that the block on the bottom, K6P4, has not been assessed yet, but it will be assessed this spring. So what are the benefits of salvaging burnt timber? BCTS is currently in the planning and development phase for cut, block, for cut blocks within the fire boundary. The focus of this development is to decrease hydrological hazard and recover hydrological function while salvaging burnt timber. This can be achieved by fixing legacy trails and roads, breaking up hydrophobic soils. This is done when we run our equipment over the soils in, within the block boundaries. And we're going to promptly reforest post-harvest, which would have vegetation growing on the site sooner than would naturally occur post-harvest. We're also replanting plantations that burnt during the fire and work was actually started on that this week. And we will be removing fire affected timber that is no longer contributing to hydrological function. Any questions? All right, comments or questions from Council, Councilor Bushel. Yes, through the chair. Grace, uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, we, uh, we received a presentation from the CSRD uh, uh, geologist, I guess, or however you want to call it. No, they're forced, they're uh, consultant, and they're saying, you know, don't touch it, leave it alone. Um, since then, I've done a whole bunch of homework and realized that maybe that myself, that might not be, that's this is my thinking, might not be the right thing to do after talking to a lot of local um, forestry people. Um, if you can, how long does it take for you to get approvals through, uh, uh, through the government to go ahead and do this? Would uh, the decision we make tonight, or the, I know this is just for information, but a uh, decision that if we made a decision tonight, would it help your uh, go ahead to start doing this mitigation? And I know that the other presentation is leave it as is, which isn't probably the right thing to do because there's so there's a lot of you know a lot of damage still up there still to come down. So. Yeah, great question. Um, I think my colleague Warren can answer that better than I can for you. Yeah, um, yeah, Warren Yablonski here. Um, so we're we're kind of we're going to go and do that work this summer. Um, that deactivation and trail work this summer. That is the plan. Um, I'm, I'm working on a funding for uh, getting some funding from wildfire right now, but um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's going to come through. And if it doesn't come through, uh, BCTS is going to have to move forward and, and uh, find the money to, to do that work because we need to do it before we harvest those blocks. Uh, there's a couple of blocks there that we need, need to need to um, do the mediation work for. So um, we're, 
we can't get on that work in the next, like it won't happen in the next couple of weeks or anything because we'll have to put out a contract and, and uh, those types of things. But the plan is to do that work this summer. Um, uh, and, you know, that's probably as soon as it is going to happen. And I don't think um, any kind of decision that is made tonight would, would expedite that or, or slow it down whatsoever. When you say this summer, are you talking July, August, or uh, June, July? Uh, what do you mean by the summer? I would I would say probably the July, August time period. <clears throat> okay, thank after, you. After the freshet here, like there's still a lot of snow in some of the areas there up top. Um, so, uh, and we are still a branch of the government. So by the time we put out a contract and get that in the works, uh, you know, it's the end of May. So. Um, I would, I would think we're a little bit, uh, you know, the end, July would be, would be quick probably. All right. Other, go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, through the chair. Yeah. Thanks Warren. Um, yeah, just, I know, I know, uh, um, there is a lot of snow up top and, and, uh, some of those culverts that, uh, are already failing or actually looking like they're going to be plugged up. Uh, are probably going to plug up and and overflow by then. Um, just I just you know thought of is there any way we could we could help the process because what you're doing is remediating it a lot better than just leaving it natural and uh, the damage could, you know the damage will be done if we don't do something before the the, the snow starts melting. I think um, so. These trails and um, and the that like that picture of that box culvert that Gray showed, those are those that stuff has been on the hillside since uh maybe somebody can correct me if i'm wrong but probably since the 60s 70s at least so it's been there for an, a number of years and uh and so um we're it's not hopefully you know we we can keep our fingers crossed but hopefully we make it through this spring and we're able to to get the majority of that work done here this this summer before um stuff goes sideways any more than it already is right so okay no it's not the best feeling we're, we're going to get in there and do the work as soon as we can it's just uh we it, it's a little bit of work to get in there okay and then one other quick one are you are you planning on harvesting any of the other burnt area that is uh that goes all the way towards Malakwa? like uh would you be putting that bridge in for us uh <laughs> at the on the skyline would you be putting that bridge back in for us? Because that, that's one of the that's one of the areas of the creek that's uh, now plugged, and they're now driving over all the all the timber, you know, the down timber and everything. And the, since they took the bridge out, now they're just using timber to drive on, and it's actually plugging it up and damming it up. So I just wondered if you guys were doing any logging up top. Um, I we have no plans to be up top in that area at this point in time but um there are areas that were burnt so we'll be looking at we've got a couple of sales and i think uh grace sort of showed them on the map and those are the first ones that we'll be getting out for sure um and that's the more heavily burnt stuff that we're trying to action first the high and moderate severity stuff and um there's only so much manpower that we've got to get stuff laid out so we'll we'll be working our way uh, up as as fast as we can but um, I can't say we'll be in there super fast and and I know which bridge you're talking about but um, I'm not 100% sure if, if we'll require that crossing. Okay thanks Warren. Yeah I, I have a question a couple of questions um, of course you realize a, that we're responsible for the safety of those people out there along Wiseman Creek and uh, and and below in that flood area. If you do get the go ahead and you're going to log that area out, is there a possibility that the District of Sycamus can get a weekly update as to what your progress is there and uh, what you're trying to accomplish and maybe even uh, send us some pictures so we're comfortable with, uh, with, uh, with what you're trying to do up there because uh, there are some very nervous people and uh, including probably our fire chief uh, as to uh, the safety of those people that are that are um, somewhat uh, in 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 puerile with uh, with what's going on there, uh, so could that be accomplished? 
yeah, we can we can keep you up to date for sure. Okay, thank you. All right, any other, Daryl, go ahead. Just a quick question, if I might, through the chair. Uh, hi, Grace, uh, we, we met at, at Owlhead there and I and, uh, appreciate you guys uh, working with us on the, the mountain bike trail stuff. Uh, I'm, I don't profess to be any kind of logging expert. I, I did a little bit of little bit of research on this and I, I see like Councillor Bushell had suggested, there's opposing views on whether this is an advantage or not to go in after and salvage log. My, my, my concern is the comment you made about the hydrotrophic soils. And so my understanding is that's the duff that burns and you get a crust at the bottom. And so I'll start with that as a comment and then a question. If you guys are going in to do that and, and you say that that promotes breaking up that hydrotrophic soil, have you given any consideration to where our water intake is and how that might impact the runoff coming into the lake? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if our hydrologist is there. I'll field that question. One um, yeah, uh, so we know where your intake is, right? Out in there. And um, where this development is planned, it's in Wiseman. Uh, some of the burn is in Sycamus. Uh, you know, Sycamus Creek has got a whole lot more power and it moves a lot more material, much more of a threat to your water intake in the whole system. Uh, Wiseman is very small, relatively speaking. And I think definitely there's going to be, regardless, uh, there's going to be a, a spike in turbidity on both those systems. If it hasn't already come, like the last week's rain in Wiseman, it sparked it up. And I think we, it was dirty water I was there on Friday. Um, so are, are we considering, yeah, we're, we're trying to do what we can. I think landslides are going to make it worse. So if we can prevent a few of those, we're going to be further ahead. Um, so well is, is a challenge. It's more a challenge in the dry belt where we don't get the snow back. When the snow, when particularly a decent snow sits and melts slow, it will recharge that and it'll have to do a little mixture around the recovery soil part, part of it. And they dry right up, but the water can't come in. So it has to reform that. So if we have snow here, it's, we may not get as much as but we might have got down in Oyama or something like that. And the whole point of going in and, and conventionally parking it, we could drive around on it and break it up and then scatter debris. So it, it, it helps to reduce that. And I guess through the chair, my concern would just be that we're exacerbating the problem. We're expecting high turbidity in the spring just because of the event. We know we're going to see ash. We're going to see things coming down. But if we've got people up there working and we, you know, create a lot more of it, that could directly impact our intake. Grace, what would be the timing of this, the actual harvesting? Um, yeah, so we would be selling, I correct me if I'm wrong, Warren, um, in the summer, and then they would have about a year to harvest, right? Or are you restricting the timing? Yeah. No, so the first sale, um, which basically um, there's a very small amount of it that's actually in the Wiseman Community Watershed. And I think that's that's a good point there. The, so that first sale um, that was on the map, and I don't know if Grace can flash it up, but uh, there's only a, um, a couple of hectares in the Wiseman Community Watershed. And we're gonna sell that here, um, the end of uh, basically what we'd call our quarter one. So it would be, um maybe june july the plan would be to harvest that this summer so that it it um so we get you know the most the if that wood sits through the summer a hot summer it starts to deteriorate very rapidly so um that what that sale will likely be harvested through this summer um point being that not a lot of it is in the community watershed now the second sale which is if you guys are looking at the map that 7TF and 2TZ. The plan for those would be to sell them uh, later in the summer, but I believe, um, uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, Michael and Ryan, but those blocks need to be harvested in the winter. That's to, right. uh, so those blocks will be winter harvested. So that should um, decrease the, the sedimentation issue that you're talking about. So Warren, um, 
just taking a look at how you're going to log that. Um, are you talking about logging the lower elevation first or the higher elevation first? How are you going to look at uh, at uh, taking? Uh... So the the first sale is that K five E T and K seven T J, those ones right there. And then the second sale, which would be planned for logging this winter or next winter, would be the okay. 7TF and the 2TZ. Those ones have to be winter harvested. And then there's a third sale down on the Wiseman, which is uh, K6P4. And um, I think it's all K6P4, but there's a, a smidgen of that one in the Wiseman community watershed as well. But uh, I'm not totally sure when that one's going to be on the sale schedule. We're still doing some developing development there. So it, um, the point being, it, it'll likely be as soon as we can go. I don't think there's any winter restrictions on it, but there's a small, only a small portion in the watershed. So, so, so the next question is, is after you've got it logged, how soon will you be reforesting that area? It'll be less than two years before there are trees on that site. Um, I believe we um, we're going to try and try and turn them around as fast as possible. But basically, when we order trees, they're a two-year. Say we order trees last fall, they take two years before we can get them to size to plant them on these sites. So um, that would be the goal. Would be say it's harvested this winter or this summer or this winter. We would we could possibly have some of it planted the following summer, but most likely the summer of 24. So, and if you waited for natural regen for these sites, we could be, you know, eight, 10 years down the road. So it's a, we got to get trees growing on these sites as soon as possible. All right, thank you. All right, any other comments or questions from council? I don't see any hands up here. So Grace Warren, and I don't know what your name was, but. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, keep us posted, keep us up to date. We want to know exactly what you're doing at all times because, of course, you've got to realize we are concerned for the people out in that particular area of the community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. I appreciate it. Bye now. All right. Moving on, Sycamore Chamber of Commerce biz after biz event road closure requests recommendation that council approve the temporary closure of Main Street from Shuswap Avenue to the narrow smokehouse barbecue restaurant for the Sycamore Chamber of Commerce biz after biz event from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Friday, May 27, 2022. I need a mover on this. Councilor Anderson seconded. Councilor Bushel, okay. Uh, could we have a staff report on this? Uh, to, go ahead, Jason. Sure. Thank you to the chair. Uh, not much to say about this one. The biz after this is something that happens in the community on a regular basis, obviously not for the last couple of years due to COVID, but they're bringing it back. It's going to be a few of these this year. This is the first one. Uh, it's a small, oh, not small closure, but a small time frame in two hours in the evening. Businesses are all part of the chamber. They're all on board with this uh, as part of it. There will be um, a beer garden and some uh, music by local entertainer at it. But basically, it's a, a small attendance, 100 people or so. Um, but some uh, porta potties brought in. And just the the area, like I said, it's indicated there will be closed during that period of time. Uh, the district itself will su supply some closures, uh, some barricades, sorry, and uh, some fencing, uh, basically just um, snow fencing for the beer garden itself. Okay. Comments or questions? Councillor Anderson. Um, just to comment, I know that uh, the businesses on Main Street generally don't like us to shut down Main Street, but. Um, um, Sheila and the gang has all gone around and, and checked with everyone. And it is a very small window. So um, yeah, I think everybody's content with that. Thank you. Right, any other comments or questions? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried. Thanks, Jason. All right, uh, new Sycamore Fire Department fire engine. Recommendation that the District of Sycamore's Council authorize the purchase of a new 2023 fire engine from Fort Gary fire trucks in Winnipeg, Manitoba. This truck purchase will be for $669,979 plus 46 
898 PST funds from the fire equipment reserve. I need a mover on this and then we can get into it. Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Anderson. Okay, Brett, give us an update and uh, we'll make a decision. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Uh, so um, we're looking to replace uh, our engine five, uh, basically in the 26 years uh, by the time it's replaced next year. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to uh, get, some, get it updated. The, that engine five still is a functioning truck. Uh, it's not requiring a ton to get a continued certification for it. And we'll have kind of a wildland response engine and we'll also use it for training in our training area in behind uh, public works there. Um, we went to uh, RFP, we had three responses to it. Um, so Fort Gary out of Winnipeg, uh, Rosenbauer and Pierce uh, out of the States. Uh, <coughs> Rosenbauer is in Florida and Pierce is in North Dakota. Uh, either way, uh, we got the, the three quotes from them um, with varying uh, rates, obviously, uh, anywhere from 800, sorry, yeah, 823,962 to as low as 669,979, which was the ordinary quote. Uh, just a little bit of information on the, the quotes that came in. Uh, the other two trucks were full size chassis. Uh, that means that uh, they're bigger and they accommodate more space and more firefighters, uh, but they're also quite a bit more expensive. The chassis that uh, Fort Gary offered us is a uh, Spartan chassis, which is very well known in the industry. And this particular one is uh, a bit smaller, um, thereby being not as expensive, uh, but because of the way it's manufactured, it offers better protection for the firefighters and uh, certainly much better uh, visibility for the driver and operators. Uh, certainly some safety factors in there that uh, come into play. Uh, one of the advantages is uh, with going with the smaller, less expensive chassis is it's similar to a, a commercial chassis if you're getting a mixed up, sorry, custom and commercial is the two types that we're dealing with. Um, a commercial chassis is pretty much what you see on the road for highways. Um, the challenge with them is they're not uh, really designed to protect the occupants because it's typically a driver, not a group of uh, people on board. Um, very custom chassis, there's better protection for the group. A couple things, uh, higher horsepower on the Fort Gary was came standard, uh, extra cost for the other two manufacturers. Uh, and based on our evaluation forms, uh, Fort Gary definitely came in with the higher marks. So the price was a big factor for sure. That's 30% on our marketing evaluation. So that's a, that's a big deal. Uh, so financially, uh, our budget was 650000 uh, We had a conversation with the crew about if we were to try and get this uh, purchase price down to six hundred and fifty, dollars could we live without? Uh, obviously, when we put together uh, an RFP, we're, say, we're basing it on a lot of our pre previous uh, fire engines. And uh, uh, one of the things that we felt we could live without was a top mount monitor. Uh, Rather than having a full on electric uh, controlled monitor, uh, we had some experience this summer from using uh, a solid core manually operated monitor, and it was actually very effective. Uh, so the crew felt that we could go to something like that. And uh, there's a, over $13,000 savings in just by removing that monitor. And then we also talked about a headset intercom system within the truck, uh, about $4,500 savings on that as well. And there's a few other areas that we looked at uh, where we could make some possible savings uh, and we feel that we can probably get very close to these $650,000. But uh, as it sits, uh, basically we're saying as the truck was bid, $669,000 plus the GSD because GSD is refunded to us, we're a total of $715,877. Uh, and uh, again, we feel that we can bring it uh, as far as uh, alignment treatment priorities, it continues our fire protection for the district settlements. All right, thanks, Brett. Uh, question for Kelly. Uh, we're over budget on this. Where's the additional money coming from? 
Um, good question. So this is the actual uh, acquisition is funded all from the fire equipment reserve. So that additional amount will be funded from the fire equipment reserve as well. So the bigger purchase this year means maybe less purchases in future years. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councilor Bushel. Yes, yeah, you the chair. Yeah, Brett, I like your report. Uh, you did a lot of homework. Good work on that. Um, uh, I just noticed um, on our report, uh, Kelly, Jennifer, and, and Evan, um, your status, uh, you didn't comment on it. Is Are you approving this? The three of you? Yeah. I believe I did. Delay. Yeah, it, it just went through a different process a from my compass. There was a bit of an issue. So it, that has nothing to do with the program. I was just checking. Because I am opposed to that. That's <laughs> <laughs> what I think about it. Other comments or questions? For I'm fine with it. All right, I hear none. Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Heard unanimously. Thanks, Brett. All right, uh, purchase of a 2011 Dodge Ram 5500 crane truck with flat deck. Recommendation that council award the purchase of a 2011 Dodge Ram 5500 to Electric Motor and Pump Service Limited for the purchase price of 68,000 plus GST. I need a mover on this. Councillor Aries, moved by Councillor Anderson. Uh, Daryl, give us a report. Uh, sure, through the chair. Uh, in a nutshell, this has been a, a, a tool that we've needed for quite a number of years. We've, uh, we've, we've priced out a crane to see if we could add it to our fleet on a, on a certain vehicle here or there. The utility uh, side of things it doesn't have anything beyond a half ton truck. So there's challenges with getting anything with uh, any kind of lifting capability to, to work on a, a smaller truck. Uh, this crane truck has actually been put into use on our municipal lift stations and it's pulled pumps. Uh, it's designed in a way that if we were gonna go out and custom build something, this is just enough reach and it's got plenty of lifting power for us and it's been slightly modified for us uh contractor that uh has brought this truck and serviced things for us over the past few years it's been we've averaged about eighteen thousand dollars a year on services rendered from this truck so uh with this we can uh do a lot more of our own pump pulling and repairs at this end it opens the whole world of uh, hydrant maintenance for us where we're not having to do it by hand and risk injuries lifting the, the stems out of the hydrants. So, uh, yeah. That's... So uh, right now, what are, what's the cost per year with contractual? For, for, for this unit, for the, for the crane unit, we're looking at about 18,000 a year. Uh, that includes some electrical work. Uh, which we'd still have to source locally to help us. Uh, but the trucks, are, it's it's over a thousand bucks every time we call them to, to come in and lift a pump for about us. About a two year or a three year to four year turnaround. It's about a three and a half year turnaround. Go ahead, Councilor Mommels. To the chair, so uh, I'm assuming that somebody will have to be certified to operate the crate. Yes. And then you realize that every year you have to have an annual inspection and that requires an engineer, so they're not cheap. We, we currently have our commercial vehicles go through CVIP, and this one would as well with the crane. So we added to that rotation. Okay. All right. Are there comments or questions? Okay, I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously again. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks. Uh, development permit number 21159 DP 806 Trans Canada Highway. Recommendation of the District of Sickness authorize and issue development permit number 21159 DP for a new visitor accommodation and multi family dwelling for the property legally described as Lot B, District Lot 497 Camelot Division, Neil District Plan. Set Plan KAP 76069. I need a mover on this, Councillor Malmas. Councillor Anderson, Scott, give us a report, please. And thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is an application for a development permit. It's for the um, addition to the Best Western. 
um, and they're looking at doing a little different model than the traditional hotel. It'd be visitor accommodation and multifamily dwelling. And staff's recommending that uh, the development permit be issued. Uh, here's an outline of the property. <clears throat> so you can see where the existing Best Western is, and then the, uh, the addition would be to the, the west of that. Um, properties in the uh, Highway Commercial B, a fish community plan area. And, uh, and then here's the, the zone. So this was rezoned back in April. Um, council uh, adopted the bylaw to rezone it. So you can see the dark purple area, that, uh, that would be the area where the addition would go. And they're also proposing a subdivision along that boundary. So the dark purple area would be its own, its own, on its own parcel. And then the existing Best Western and the, the other um, kind of motel style accommodation would be on a, a separate parcel. And the, the new zone allowed for multifamily dwelling in addition to the, the accommodation. So the development permit, you can see the, the site plan, the light blue is the, uh, the new building. So looking at a six story building, 40 units, uh, 10 attainable housing units. So they're willing to enter into a, a contract with the, the district for um, a housing agreement where those 10 units would be, remain available as rentals um, through uh, an agreement. Um, hopefully you can get the housing committee involved and they'd help select how people would be chosen to stay there. I know the Best Western needs employees, so that's the main reason they, they want to, uh, to go down this road is they want a, a spot for employees so it can provide that, the housing that's needed. Uh, commercial on the main floor, um, and then the, building, uh, the development permit uh, looks at the building finishes, landscaping, lighting, parking, and then that fire lane. Um, here you have the, uh, the rendering of the building. So um, kind of a light gray, blue um, color palette with some timbers, um, stucco, and then uh, <clears throat> you can see the, the roof details and things. Um, so that's essentially the uh, form and character. And then you can actually see outline Tim Hortons is the kind of uh, the building in the, in the front, the, the red outline of the building. So just in relation to the, the size, how it's gonna look. And then the, the landscaping plan, um, they're gonna try and keep the, as many trees on the west uh, boundary as possible. There's some really big cedars there. Um, they've also, through the Planning and Development Committee, requested they, so right along that, um, that fire lane, there's, there's gonna be some parking there and there's some cedars there and they're gonna try and retain as many of those cedars as they can and, and keep them on the property uh, and transplant them. Uh, one of the conditions of the permit is that that be identified as a, a no stopping area and it's painted as a fire lane. So that was one of the questions Councillor Mullen was asked by law enforcement officer. So we put it, they share that lane. So it's Tim Hortons and Best Western. So we're, we're putting that in this as well to, to make sure that they, they follow up with that. Um, comments, um, planning and development committee recommended uh, approval. Um, Hydro asked for a right away at the subdivision stage. Uh, engineering um, asked for road upgrades at the subdivision stage. So when they go through the subdivision, we can then give them um, a list of things they need to do to meet those, those offsite services. And one of them is the, the road upgrades. And, and then the, the fire department had some concerns um, just with the the building, it's gonna be a, a taller building, but their biggest concern was the concern over uh, fire during construction. It's gonna be a wood frame building. So having that big wood frame building, it's gonna be sprinkled in the end, but before the sprinkler's installed, you're gonna have this massive wood structure. So there are some concerns at the, during the construction phase of, of having that risk as well. Um, it was referred out um, as part of the, um, for so the development permits don't have to go to neighboring properties and they're not advertised or, or notified, but this one was part of the public hearing process for the rezoning and I don't think we received any uh, any concerns from the public at that time. So staff's recommending that uh, this development permit be approved. Yep. Now we knew we have a new fire truck to look after, and Councilor McCabe. Then uh, thank you, Councilor Mullins. Um, yeah, the affordable housing portion, I'm, I'm glad that uh, the developer is recognizing that and, and offering that up, but it, it still seems to me like it's it's a carrot. And uh, being asked to uh, approve this uh, permit ahead of a housing agreement, I would think that we want to see a housing agreement in place because they're offering it before we approve this permit. Makes sense to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking about it wrong. Um, and then 
a couple more questions, uh, just statements really. So with the housing units, I, I know they're, they're gonna need some accommodation for their employees. So basically I see potentially as they're just a, a business and, and uh, they're building accommodation for their employees, but throwing it out to us as a carrot saying, yes, we're creating affordable housing in your community, where in fact, it's gonna be probably, depending on the housing agreement that we sign, uh, is it at fair market value? Is it 20% below fair market value? Uh, and, and who dictates who goes into those housing units? Is it, is it the local housing society? Is it the, the owner of the development? Um, I, I'd be interested in seeing a housing agreement before I was to uh, approve this permit. And I, I noticed on the permit, the permit doesn't even say on condition of approved housing agreement. As a minimum, I would like to see an amendment to the permit to, to show that uh, the permit is subject to an agreed how, uh, assigned uh, housing agreement. That's good. So like, there's a lot of moving parts. So one, one part is that in order for them to get financing, they need to have the development permit in place. And so they're looking for some financing that would, and it, it probably likely coming from BC Housing, that then would, then they could finance this. So they need the development permit before they get the financing and then provide that attainable housing. Um, with a development permit, you can't put in conditions that aren't in the official community plan. So our official community plan doesn't require in the guidelines affordable housing. So for us to put that in the permit, it would mean nothing, right? So, and blasphemy. You know, Somebody wanted to <laughs> challenge it legally, then yeah, they they wouldn't, they couldn't do that. In the new zoning bylaw, bylaw one thousand, there's that density bonus in there. So as it sits right now, they would their the the zone would allow them to have thirty units, and then once they provided the affordable housing, they get a, a bonus unit. So for ten units, that they'd, they'd be able to get up to the the forty units they're they're looking for. So. The new zoning bylaw, it'll be in the zoning bylaw and, and that'll be, you know, if you're talking about the carrot, that'll be the stick where then we have the ability to, to have them do that through the, the zoning bylaw. The timing just hasn't worked right. Um, but I think, yes, you're right. We're, we're going out, you know, based on uh, <laughs> promises, but uh, I, I'm confident that it's gonna move forward and they're gonna provide those 10 units and, and I would expect through our housing agreement, it's going to be the housing committee that sets the parameters for who gets to stay there. It's not going to be subsidized housing. It's probably going to be kind of a market housing rate, but for long-term rentals. Councilor Malmas, do you want to comment on the planning committee? Uh, through the chair, along the lines of Councilor McCabe's uh, comment, um, they're, they're doing 44 units in total. 10 of them are supposed to be uh, a rental that they're going to go through BC housing to get. So that means they're getting financing from them. But the other 30 units are basically the way this is worded hotel rooms. Pardon me? The other 30 units are basically hotel rooms, which when they came to the planning and development committee, they basically said this whole building was going to be housing with 10 units that were going to be affordable or rent assisted by whatever we decided on. And now those other 30 units that we're going to be housing are now turned into hotel rooms. Because that was not the discussion that I recall at the Planning and Development Committee meeting. Go ahead. So they, they'll, they will be able to decide whether they're hotel rooms, like as sleeping units, or whether they're dwelling units like it's flexible for them to, to decide although 10 of them will be should be maintained as attainable housing councillor evans you have a comment go ahead yeah i remember that differently i do remember them saying that 10 of the rooms would be for affordable housing and my impression was the rest of it would be hotel that's good gord yeah through the chair i did ask Pankesh. uh uh, through well, I can't remember which meeting it was, and and this this is a commercial hotel development. Uh, he's applying for forty units, and ten are going to be affordable, and the rest of the thirty could be hotel hotel rooms, or even could be long term rental. 
but he did say the 30 units were going to be hotel. Council Anderson. And um, if you guys are going to refresh my memory, how many of those rooms are going to be used for staff? Because some of that was staff accommodations as well, if I remember correctly. Is he on the line? He's not. Hmm. Council Rule Cave. Did Councillor Anderson, is he not on the line? No. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, don't get me wrong. I support this. I think it's great for second lease of economic development, economic growth. Um, I think it's going to accelerate our four laning uh, through second lease. Because <laughs> good luck turning left uh, eastbound on, on uh, Rama. <laughs> uh, so it'll help us in our quest to uh, establish some four laning through town. <laughs> Funny so, again. I mean, I do support this, but I, 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 you know, I didn't realize that our OCP as it exists or our bylaws as it exists don't allow or give us permission to put a condition in a permit that says a portion of this or two doors have to be affordable housing. We're, we're legally, we can't do that. So uh, that's the job for our housing committee to get that fixed. Go ahead, Jeff. To the chair. Uh, so I guess what because you know we our, our town manager says that you know usually private does never participate on what they're going to do with their money so i'm assuming that bc housing if they're going to them for funding will insist on what portion is what so that's our safeguard that we're going to get some affordable housing because if they're going to bc housing specifically for funding they, there's no flexibility. You have to have however many units. Go ahead, Colleen. Thanks. Do we know that for sure that they're going to BC Housing for financing? And what happens if BC Housing turns them down? So I I know they they need the development. I know they've been well. They've told me they've been in conversation with BC Housing. They need to get the development permit stage in order to further the conversation with BC Housing, and. I think, yeah, we're, we are trusting that that's the direction they're going. If BC Housing turns them down, I don't know what their plan is going to be. They will be able to proceed with, you know, if you issue this permit with the building as it is, it's the, it's the 10 units that maybe would be in question. All right, go ahead. One more comment. <clears throat> it's not, at least it's not a service station. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Culture McCabe. Yeah, so no disrespect to staff, but I mean, so the way it sits, um, we have no guarantees that it's there's going to be affordable housing. If there is affordable housing, we have no guarantees that uh, they have any uh, control over who uses those units. Period. Free enterprise, go ahead. So the, the big the big issue could, could be solved if if our if our bylaw was a little further ahead, then they would get that density bonus. So that would be that would be the the thing that they would that would require them to buy that affordable housing in order to build to the, the density they want to build to. But in until then, um, we're going to have to trust them. Yeah, yeah. I'm almost go ahead. So it might not be in our official community plan, and it might not be the wording that we have to tell with the you old know, affordable housing units. Uh, what about just 10 units, affordable or not? Can we can we install that in here? 10 rental units, long-term rental units. So, so they it's it's flexible right now, so they can have dwelling units or sleeping units so they could so right now you know you issue this permit um you know they choose not to provide any attainable units and they they start construction they get their building permit and their subdivision and everything prior to this bylaw being adopted then yeah they could probably move forward without providing any kind of attainable housing or rental housing you could just be another 40 hotel units which I don't think it would be a horrible thing for this town, but they have they they have worked with us in good faith towards towards it, and I think I trust them enough to, to recommend it. It's up to council to make the decision, though. Go ahead, Gord. Yes, yeah, you, the chair. You know what? You know I've dealt with the Best Western for a long time with the previous owners and even the new owner, 
And uh, I mean, this guy has gone out and bought a business in our town, paid millions of dollars for a business. He employs close to 40 people in this town and he's trying to build, build more units. It is commercial property. It's highway commercial, it's zoned for hotel. Yeah, it's a bonus if we get 10 units out of it. If we don't get 10 units out of it, we have a new building that's gonna have more employees, more than 40 employees. So to, to, to put a, a, a kibosh on this tonight and say we want to say we want affordable housing when our own official community plan and our bylaws don't, go towards that he's you know he's he's done his due diligence maybe he that's why he's putting it ahead now and not next year so he knows next year he might not be able to but myself i support this development for sure probably one of the most essential things in sycamus right now is trying to build housing so that we can attract a workforce my comments go ahead jeff do you want to have a lot i'm not i'm not opposed to the development at all it's just that you know, usually staff, and especially the planning department, is purely black and white. It, you know, if it's not on paper, it's not good. You know, this tree has to be here, and that fence has to be over there. So, if you've got a relationship where you trust it, like I said, I don't, I don't have an issue with it. It is zoned as hotel. It is zoned for what they're using it for. If there's ten rooms, yeah, we're getting a bonus out of it. But uh, the discussion was is that was going to happen, and. You know, we would have our zoning bylaws in place. It's only been five and a half years since we started working on it. So, <laughs> all right, I'm going to call a question on the resolution. We've got a mover and a second on this. Yes, all in favor. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're good. All right, I'm going to call a question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thanks, God. 417, 425 Main signage, <laughs> Councillor Evans, recommendation that staff be directed to install signage on 417, 425 Main Street, identifying site of future housing developments. I need a mover on this. Councillor Evans, <laughs> Councillor Aries. Do you want to comment at all, Councillor Evans? No, I, I just think that as soon as possible, it'd be great to get, get the, uh, the sign up there. Good looking sign that just uh, rallies enthusiasm as much as we can. And also makes that big empty lot look like school places. Put it right next to the bear. Yeah. Uh, Councillor McCabe, go ahead. So will we have a chance to look at the proof of the sign before it's fabricated? Or, or I guess my question is, what is the sign gonna say? Can we? keep it to a generic level in case, um, you know, there's some moving parts. We don't know exactly how many units. So I, I would suggest not to mention, you know, 54 units or 90 units or, or the amount of units or, or, or even mention any of our partners, just sort of generic uh, site for future affordable housing or attainable housing. Commercial sites. Evan, uh, mm -hmm. any? Yeah, we can do up a, and we can send it out to council. It'll be future future home housing project. Our logo. Yeah, Perfect. There's, no, there's no provincial or or federal funding that requires a certain format or specified design on the sign, so it's more internal. So we can run it by it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not necessary. I'm oh, sorry. Go oh, yeah. ahead. I'm not necessarily asking that because I don't want to stall it. I think that, like Councillor Evans says, the sooner we get a sign up, the better. Um, we can leave it in your discretion of what it says. I was just asking for it to please be generic and not specific to any right. any partners or what you know what I'm no. generic. Councillor Bushel okay. and Councillor Malmes. Yeah, it's, uh, I think momentum breeds momentum, and uh, this come, we're coming on to summer, and I think Bob's right. It's nice to get a sign up there, and it would be really nice to have an artist rendition with uh, uh, ad advertisement for commercial space for rent on the bottom floor. <laughs> but you know, it's uh, you never know, eh? Uh, get get in interested names who who who's looking for commercial space. Councilor Moms, go ahead. You know, a sign is a is a great idea, but you know. I don't know how much discussion we've got a housing committee and we haven't had a, a meeting with with Bill to discuss what the final design is going to be or how many units there are. We're still waiting for BC Housing to have their meeting. There's there's still a lot of things that aren't nailed down. 
we're going to put up a sign and then you know what's going to happen? Pay it for it. That's exactly what the community is going to ask. Who's going to pay for that? Like, we purchased the land. The land was going to a different organization that they had funding from BC Housing to actually build it. Who's going to pay? That'll be the question we get asked. So I'm not sure. Sides, sides are a great thing about what we're going to do, but also instills curiosity. So I think a generic sign is warranted. All these people, I, I, there are lots of people asking me questions about that particular property and wherever it goes. It's some sort of generic sign, I think it'll be warranted. All right. Um, any more comments on this? Okay, I'll call a question. All those in favor? Opposed? Council, what's the opposed? Well, well, fine. I don't want to answer any questions about it. Send them all to Evan. <laughs> Second was sign lighting. The foundation and staff were directed to investigate lighting options for the Sycamore sign along Highway 97A. We need a mover on this. Councillor Evans, seconded by Councillor Bushel. Mr. Evans, would you like to comment on this too? Uh, I always just love it when folks are coming into town and it's dusk or nighttime for that beautiful white Sycamore sign to be lit up um, with an independent light just so they can see it well. Okay. Gord? Excuse me, Chair. This was put on on uh, on Joe's plate uh, eight, six years ago. <laughs> We've been asking for lights on those incoming signs for, for quite a while, and they were supposed to be done. They were supposed to be solar. I know there was a power issue, but uh, I know it would be really nice to have them lit up, sure, all, all three of them. All right, Dr. Malmus. Well, there is a solar supplier in town, local business. And you could figure out what you need for wattage. I mean, I'd like to see one of those floodlights, like what shine right in my bedroom window from OK Tires, <laughs> which is a Cal Tire, or the one that's- Point of order. <laughs> so it's, it's just, how bright a light are you gonna put up there? We have a resolution on the floor. I'm gonna call a question. All those in favor? All those in favor? Okay, unanimous. All right, uh, for discussion, car show, Carter Mamas, you wanted to talk about the car show? You missed one. Basketball courts. Oh, basketball. Uh, Counselor Evans, sorry, I missed that. Just going for the hat trick tonight. Um, I, it, obviously, these, these gentlemen are. Uh, on the ball. So uh, I was at the PAC meeting last week and they asked me if I would uh, um, implore the district to allow some basketball nets of some kind there, not just for the high school students, but also for the community. <coughs> and it'd be nice to have a place where you don't have to chase the ball into the street every time you miss a basket. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a yard block. That's kind of funny. Yeah. But she's <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 sir, I would just trust the staff to continue that discussion. With yeah, I'm just looking at Daryl. What through the chair? <laughs> he's, got, <laughs> he's in there now. So he's got, a, he's got an appointment set. Have you got it figured out? Yeah. Not yet, but we're working on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, once, okay. Yeah. Once. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Thanks. That was the hat trick. Car show. Mr. Malmus, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just asked, and I don't know, maybe it sounds like they might have already come and visited with you because they wanted quite a bit of Main Street, both sides. And so this is one of the events that's on the Canada Day weekend. So, Correct. And so if they've been to visit you, then maybe you could just elaborate just a tiny little bit on what they're asking for. I, I, I can't thank you to the chair. Uh, they, they, they've submitted the request to us. Um, it's going to have a report for council here, but then when we dug in, there were a lot more details we needed from them. They didn't provide enough, so we met with them recently, and there'll be a report for next council providing they do what they need to do. You're right, the request is basically to block off Main Street in its entirety um, for the for the, the time of the event. Um, so we've asked them 
to, well, first of all, they hadn't talked to anybody um, down the strip, but also we've asked them to go talk to everybody and report back to us as to what, what comes from there. Um, the, the, the mayor did attend our, our meeting as well and expressed any concerns about 200 Main in, the, in those areas as well um, that, that we have. Um, that we wouldn't have allowed cars, at least in, the, in that application or the beer gardens. So they're aware of those type of things. But um, yeah, all the, the fine details they haven't got to us yet. They sort of just gave us a <clears throat> grand plan and we're looking for them to provide us more detail and then we'll bring a report to council with those. Okay, thanks, Jason. All right, um, any more discussion on that, Jeff? Uh, just the idea that, you know, they, they had the car show uh, year before the bid, uh, it, it hasn't happened since. And I thought it was a pretty decent car show that they had on Main Street. And they had about half of Main Street. So it was well attended in conjunction with the other things that we were doing at the same time. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of people that have a lot of interesting cars that you know, they don't drive them every day, but they, they'll bring them to a car show. So. So I attended the meeting the other day and uh, they've got a different format. They've got a different vision and they're working it out with Jason right now. And uh, something that I told them that uh, they probably wouldn't get this past council and that's to be using 200 main in order to put a beer garden on. And I said, that probably not going to happen, but they have got other options lined up for that right now. So uh, I don't want to compromise 200 main because it could be a compromise. All right, Councilor Anderson. And Jason, just make sure that they do their due diligence about checking with all the business owners on Main Street because the last time we did this, there were a lot of unhappy business owners because it did take their revenue down for that day. Yeah, it, that was, yeah. through the chair, that was, that was made very clear. We, we wanted a full accounting of everybody they visited and what was said. Um, at that time, so yes, that will be for Thank you. From the discussion, their main focus is to try to accommodate all of the businesses and make the businesses successful from because of the car show. I like what they what they were saying. All right, any other comments on this? Gord, go ahead. Jason, or has, have we ever thought about? I know we we talked to Wayne a few years back, and he liked it in Finlayson Park. Have we ever thought about uh, Beach Park? Yes, we did approach them and they outright rejected it because it's not big enough. They can't bring enough cars in. They wanted to do about 200 cars and they said they can only with 75 as Beach Park. I feel it was big enough. And Finlayson right now has got some issues when it comes to the, out, the uh, fields and you know, some of that stuff has to get fixed up. Uh, I think probably Maine is the best idea. But anyway, we're, they're working it out with Jason and Jamie. All right, moving on. Uh, we still got lots to go here, guys. Uh, zoning amendment application number 22043 Zed Parksville Street. Recommendation of the District of Sycamus zoning amending bylaw number 1020-2022 be given first and second reading as presented this 11th day of May 2022. Moved by Councillor Malmas, seconded by Councillor Bushell, any comments or questions on this? This was brought to the planning committee meeting. Okay, if not, I'm gonna call a question. Go ahead. Sorry, Jeff, if we to the planning committee, can you just give us a quick? Um, well, basically they came to the planning committee meeting and they wanted to, we tried to make it that it was a overall blanket uh, rezoning. Is that what you're showing now? Yeah. Okay, so we won. Actually, they had come back once before for just six or seven lots. And we said, let's just make it what the new zoning bylaw is for the setbacks. And then they don't ever have to come back here again. And then they're, they're done. They're building new construction. So basically they can build it to it. They don't have to come. And we said, don't come back for variance. Just make it fit on the lawn. Go ahead. Done. You done? Okay. I think so. Unless you want something else, <laughs> you want me to add. So. All right. Any other comments or questions on this? Okay. I'm going to call a question. You got to move her in a second on this. I don't have it noted. I don't know if I missed it. I did at Gord Bushel. Thank Gord. you. Okay. Uh, first, yeah. Thank you. So, 
Go ahead. Thank you. One question, thank you. Yeah. So if we approve this right now, it's just gonna match what our new bylaw is going to be? Is that correct? Yes. And our new bylaw is gonna come into effect in September or something or? Yeah, thank you. Probably. All right, we're good. I don't have to ask Scott. Okay, I'm gonna call the question on the on the resolution. Any other quote? Okay. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. All right, get it out. Zoning am app, uh, amendment application number 2206-3Z, 506 and 508 Cal Street, recommendation of the District of Sycamore Zoning Amendment bylaw number 1021-22 be given first and second reading as presented this 11th day of May, 2022. I need a mover on this. Councillor Malmas, Councillor Aries. Scott, can you give us a bit of, of a breakdown on this? I can, thank you. So this is an application um, for a, a special regulation that would allow secondary units in a duplex or a two unit dwelling. Um, I mean, Katie Gilbert's the applicant and she is on the line. This went to the, the Planning and Development Committee. That's recommending they get first and second reading and then move towards the, the public hearing. Property 508 uh, and 506 Capel Street, you can see on the, the drawing here um, where it is uh, on Capel Street, um, Highway 97 is just a little further um, west. Uh, the property is owned residential low density um, and is owned R1, R2, so a, a two family dwelling is permitted in the, in the zone. So here's a ortho photo showing a, a little bit closer up on the, uh, or a little more zoomed in, I guess, of the, the property. So uh, a two family dwelling was built <clears throat> and then um, two, a suite was added to each side of the duplex. Um, the zoning bylaw doesn't allow suites in duplexes um, and, and it's by uh, regulation in the, the zoning bylaw. Um, so they wanna legitimize the, the suites. So there's uh, two suites, downstairs, um, both 676 square feet, and then uh, two units upstairs of 1,700 uh, square feet. So the, the existing regulation, the bylaw says a secondary suite is not permitted in a two-family dwelling. So the proposal is to add a uh, special regulation in the bylaw that applies to this property only, saying that each dwelling unit is allowed a secondary suite. And then it further says that this, the secondary suite shall mean that so be maintained the same real estate entity as the, the principal dwelling unit. So the buildings are split. So it's, they're each their own strata title. Um, and so we're saying that they have to remain just as two, two titles. They couldn't then further stratify it and have four strata. So it'll always remain a, a secondary suite in the building. Uh, we sent this out for referrals. Um, I guess the one came back from the, the bylaw enforcement officer, a uh, building permit will be required. So to legitimize these two units, they were built without a building permit. They will be required to get building permit. They will be required to meet BC building code. So that's a little bit of a, a risk. You know, it's hard going back in time, figuring out what exactly happened and can they meet code. Um, there were uh, also engineering just had a, a question about the servicing. They may need to be upsized. So of course, when it was built, it was built not for four units, but for two units. Um, but again, it does provide a, a need. It's an existing use. Um, staff's recommending that, uh, that this bylaw be given first and second reading. Excuse me. All right. Comments or questions from council? <clears throat> All right. Go ahead. Thanks to the chair. Well, this is somebody on the zoning uh, committee. It's nice, uh, interesting to see a, a fourplex essentially in this format going ahead. And I think it's a good example of what we can we can sacrifice uh, in for for the parking. As this place used to have a lawn and stuff, and now it's got lots of parking for four places, uh, but no lawn. So there's a bit of sacrifice there, maybe to the to the beauty of the community. But th that being what it is, it's just a good example of like you know four residences under one roof and i'm interested to uh, to see how this goes and i'm in, in support of it good all right i'm going to call a question then all those in favor carried unanimously thank you for that um, let's see this next one Recommendation that the District of Sycamore Zoning Bylaw Number 1000-2022 be given second reading as presented this 11th day of May 2022. 
I need a mover on this. Dr. Malma, seconded by Council Anderson. Scott, you want to give us a brief report on this as well? And thank you. So this applicant or this uh, zoning bylaw was given first reading in August after it sounds like many years of uh, trying to get it to this point. Um, staff has sent it out for referrals and, um, and we received those back. Um, the I think it they all went pretty well as far as referrals go until you get to the, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. That's going to be our, our big struggle here. Um, <clears throat> basically, they've they've said their approval is not granted because it affects land within 800 meters of a controlled access highway and there's two through our town. Every property in town essentially is, is affected. So they've, uh, they've said they wanna see some mitigation to uh, reduce the impacts on the highways. Um, they've essentially asked for, I think it's uh, 17 traffic impact assessments and 23 comments on properties. Um, Sarah and myself have met with them a couple of times um, I think they're being quite heavy handed um, to uh, to ask for those things. An example would be on, um, on Meyer Road, where there's like a little bit of an industrial park. The previous use was industrial use. And in the zone, we've listed a bunch of industrial uses. And they said, well, you've added all these uses. And we've tried to explain, well, no, we've actually put definitions and fine tuned the uses and identified some uses in other areas. Another example would be um, uh, some of the existing strata. So there's one existing strata on Riverside. You know, they said, well, if that was, if that was, if nothing was built, you'd be adding 110 units per hectare, which meets our standard, which then requires the traffic impact assessment. We were like, but it's built, it exists. And I'm like, no, we, we judge it based on if it was a new build. And it, it, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, we've added some wording to try to appease them and we've changed some zones and we've reduced some of the density in a couple areas. So we'd really like to get this to second reading so we can go back and continue the conversation with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Um, the, other, the other issue, the bigger biggest one, I think that council has heard this and staff has heard this has been the short-term rentals. Um, we, ha we have those regulations, uh, the short-term rental um, in, the, in the general regulations. And um, I think those are, are pretty clear. And I think, I think most of council in the, um, have agreed to those. Um, the big question is where are they gonna be permitted? So this, this bylaw right now promote our, um, uh, would allow for in the R1 and two zone, you, you can have right now, you can have one dwelling unit or a secondary suite. Um, Apply to rezone to have two dwelling units in separate buildings. So the on our two zone will allow two dwelling units, um, however you want to see fit on each parcel, um, and it would also allow one dwelling unit and one sleeping unit. So think of your traditional bed and breakfast, or you can think of someone having a carriage house and having and renting that out as a short term rental, or someone living in a carriage house and renting the main unit out as a short term rental. So we've said you can have two dwelling units. You can have one dwelling unit and one short-term rental, but you can't have only a short-term rental on a property. Um, we've also added a multi-unit residential. So we've added a second multi-unit residential zone um, where short-term re rentals are permitted. So the MUR1 would allow, um, would be your traditional dwelling units. And the MRUR, MUR2 would be uh, where short-term rentals are permitted. So based on just the different uses of the stratas. Um, we've identified the ones that are more traditional dwelling units and then leaving the other ones optional where they could rent out those dwelling units as sleeping units as short-term rentals. And the next steps for these would be what Councillor Anderson is talking about is coming up with that short-term rental bylaw, fine tuning that, and then the business bylaw. And, and hopefully we'd work on those and have those in the meantime. Um, so the next step I think is definitely going to be working with Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure um, and getting, getting approval through, through them or assurance of approval, um, getting some of that short-term rental stuff identified. And I think it's important that council agrees, if four to seven councillors agree, then we can start giving people a little bit more accurate information. We can say this has gone to second reading and, uh, and hopefully we can get some feedback from QD and be prepared for the, the public hearing. Um, I think this bylaw is probably going to come back to council 
one more time before we look at doing a public hearing. And uh, right now, staff's recommending that it get second reading as amended. Councilor McCabe, Councilor yeah, thank you, Anderson. I think Councilor Malmes. A great opportunity to remind the Ministry of Transportation that their request would be a moot point if in the last eight years we've been asking for four leaning through our community and now they've turned around and held us hostage for uh, more housing and, and we need housing to accommodate workers and we need workers to uh, accommodate economic growth in our community. So we're being held hostage hostage economically because of their lack of planning for four lanes through our community. We've been pushing for that for eight years now and we have nothing. We're not asking for construction, we're just asking for design drawings to uh, that would I'm sure mitigate most of their concerns about the traffic impacts. I know you can't do that, but I just had to say it. Councillor Anderson. I just have, um, I mean, this is, this is, it's big, right? It's not just about short-term rentals. It's about our zoning or industrial park, our downtown core. When we put this together as staff, do we look at what's allowed in other places or what should be allowed in Sycamus? The reason I'm asking this is because in here we have allowable use downtown as a casino. Now, downtown Sycamus doesn't have space for a casino, but if someone did sneak a half acre and put a casino, where are they parking? Like, is that, do we want that included in our bylaw that you can build a casino on Main Street when really you can't? That's one of my questions. So and some, some of the others are um, like, we have marinas, but now we have a houseboat, um, commercial marinas, like we have a lot of zones that we might be able to, to, you know, combine. Like houseboat commercial, can that just go in commercial marina? Again. Go ahead, Scott. So I think when, when I came here about a year ago, then we had a, a zoning bylaw and it probably had three, five zones and we've narrowed it down to 23 zones. So we, <laughs> we said, okay, what, what do we need in second loose and what don't we need? I think as far as casino goes, I think there's like four different types of casinos. There's like gaming, uh, gaming something. Like there was like four different types of casinos. So we, we narrowed those down. Do I think, I don't know if maybe somebody might want to build a casino one day. If, if council feels they want casino stricken from it, that's, that's easy to do. Um, but, but we've narrowed it down. We've narrowed down the uses. We spent a lot of time making this bylaw from, you know, we, we thought 100 pages out of it. I mean, the houseboat marina was something that just didn't quite fit. That's a made in sickness solution where we identified houseboat marina because it just, just the way that it was, it was that the two houseboat marinas want to have on their property, then we, we came up with a unique zone for those alone. So I would say this is definitely a made in Sycamus solution. It's, it's what I think that could occur in Sycamus and I don't, I don't know if there'll ever be a casino. So, can I just finish? Go ahead. One Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Just going, and I've been going over it in depth lately and um, the map, there is commercial marinas on the channel and they're not shown on the map. They're not named like splashes, three boys. Those are all commercial marinas and they're not shown on the map. Um, and when you're going into marinas, and this is just things that I've, you know, I've, I've made notes on so I can send them to you, but you've got group moorage and you've got swimming platforms in group moorage, which is a marina and you should never have a swim platform in a marina because it's just not a safe place to swim. So there's a lot of things in here. That's just a few that I've picked out, but we still have a lot of work to do on this and to correct this because I found some errors. So, but going to second reading, we'll probably keep it moving, but it may come back to council maybe another couple times before we get it all straightened out. Yeah, that's the idea of the resolution is to get it moving um, based on second reading. Uh, Councilor Malmish, you're up, and then Councilor Bushel. Yeah, I'm just going to be blunt. This was three years ago. A fellow was brought in, Mark Holland. 
we picked a community that had just uh, their zoning bylaws. It's called Penticton. They have First Nations, they have water on two sides. They have a highway going through the middle of it. So they they had just about everything we had, and that was the basis of the start point. And so this has been evolving for three years. And now some people are deciding to read it and critique it. And we're in the 20th hour. This shouldn't be, this shouldn't be delayed another year because Part of our problems with some of the things that are going on in the community, like a gas station on the corner of Main Street, is because we haven't updated our zoning bylaws since 1993. That's the date, it's 1993. So if there was opportunity, the staff has asked for us to look at this a number of times, and the planning committee has looked at it a number of times, and we've sent in our comments, and that's how you get it to you send it in the comments and if it's wordy or it's just lord and i can't read everything and fix it all right there's a lot of information in there, a lot of information making this delay till next year not gonna be a good idea councillor bushel and councillor anderson again Okay, through the chair, um, it's part of the process. We got to get it through second, second, uh, second reading, and, and I'm sure, I'm um, hopefully we will tonight. Um, yeah, we we all spent lots of time on it, and, and and we'll spend more time on it uh, as we go through. But um, you know, you guys are you're starting to get her done. I'm happy that's going ahead. My my big concern is that you wonder why our community has not grown uh, ever. <laughs> is uh, if you look at what the ALC put in their letter, uh, in the referral letter, if you look at the CSRD, what they put in the letter, and you look at highways, what they put in their letter. Um, they just, all three of those, those uh, agencies um, have too much say in our community. And uh, I just, I, just, I don't think we should listen to them. <laughs> to be bummy. it's just it is so uh, uh, strangling in our community. Trying like ALC, you can't do anything within thirty meters of a fence. Like you know, on some on some of this stuff, it's just and our whole town is ALC, and we can't even do anything with it. You know, uh, so we we really have to take a look at the referrals and say, are the do we do we really even listen to this? And like Scott says. Maybe we need to go above the Salmon Arm office. We need to go to Vernon or maybe Victoria, but we can't listen to their their, their comments because we this community will never go anywhere if we if we do what they want. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, to be quite honest, you. But uh, you know that's why we're going through this process in order to get this done. I don't know whether you want to restrict what you're doing with your zoning bylaws more so than giving you all the options that are available to you for the future. And so that's where my concern would be as, okay, how restricted do you want to be? Because that's exactly what's happening when you're talking about the CSRD and the ALC and so forth. Okay, so just be careful what you wish for when you're trying to readjust these bylaws because uh, you don't want to restrict them that much. In my opinion, I would think that uh, you nailed it because we are, we are actually controlled by outside sources. And uh, that's what we're fighting against on almost every occasion. So anyway, my take, so Colleen, you're next. Thanks. Uh, it won't be another year, Jeff. I think that that's, you're just being a little over dramatic there. There's just a few tweaks and a few corrections on the map that need to be made because it can't be approved like this. So just making, uh, you know, a point. Ahead, Jeff, you're next. So, yeah, no, I, I, you know what? I've been trying to get this done for five years. I've had it up. Like it's time to get it done. And I honestly thought through the chair, we actually went and listened to the uh, OCP for area E, Rhoda Martin had an open house. We made some comments, right? I think at the time I specifically asked, uh, these comments that we make, they're just comments. They look at them, they consider them. They don't have to accept anything. That's what 
you said, is that correct? Like, so we said to the CS, to, to the area and their OCP that, you know, we don't like bylaw 900 and we asked about this, we asked about that, and, and but they still went ahead. There was a couple of things that they considered, but the other three or four things, they just, they never did anything with. So is that the same process for us here now today? Like, go ahead, Scott. So the Ministry of Transportation has to approve the bylaw. It has to. It has to. They actually have to sign it off and approve it. So do we shoot. <laughs> I'll explain the word. All right. Go ahead, Councillor Bushel. To the chair, how about the, uh, the CSRD and the ALC? It, they don't have to approve the bylaw. I think the ALC, we, yeah, I, it would be very tricky to do things that, you know, run against them, but I think we've done our best to to to, to uh, appease them, but also keep the door open for future development as well. But uh, um, I think we're in, we probably are pretty good with the LC. But uh, so we could just write a letter back and say thank you very much for your comments. Don't we don't have to write a letter back. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Councilor Malmas. Uh, they'll notice that when we pass it, we didn't take the recommendations, right? So, um, through the chair, will will the MOTI thing become a political? Because we got one branch of the government. It's called housing. You got to densify. You got to build more houses. And the other, however, the government that builds a road says, well. Everybody's got to do a study, cost money, and, and your affordability goes out the window because all these studies, everything that you do costs money. So how do the two different governments get to, there's a win-win situation there. Go ahead, Scott. It's, it's funny, if you listen to the radio, they're talking about the province taking away powers and municipalities to speed up housing. The thing that's slowing this one down is the provincial government. Is Ministry of Transportation. Do I think it's going to get political? I hope not. I hope that we can yeah. meet with them and, and sort it out. Um, if it does get political, I'll leave that to, to Evan to arrange those, uh, those meetings. So we've had good discussion on this, but let's get back to the resolution. Um, Okay, I'm going to open up the floor for any more comments on this, and we'll get back to the resolution. We're talking first and second reading here. Okay, I'm not hearing any more. I'm going to call a question on the resolution. All those in favor? Carried, thank you. All right. Yeah, not the first. Yeah. All right, so vacation policy. Number 819 and exempt employee compensation policy number 820. The council amend vacation policy number 819 has presented this 11th day of May 2022. And further, that council adopt exempt employee compensation policy number 820 as presented this 11th day of May 2022, replacing management compensation policy 820. Before I ask for a mover and a seconder on this, Kelly, can you give us a report? Yes. On the final accomplishment. Yes, most definitely. So per periodically we review our policies to make sure they are consistent with what we're actually doing. Uh, it's been a few years since we've looked at these policies and we noticed we needed to make some uh, minor modifications. Uh, so the vacation policy, the only thing we changed here was we modified some wording around the retirement bank. Uh, so uh, staff are allowed to accrue a day, I mean, uh, a little bit of their time into a retirement bank if they've worked a certain um, number of years here. Well, now we have somebody actually using the retirement bank. Um, and so we're adding some wording on the payment of that retirement bank so that it's not continued uh, pay, that it's just a lump sum payment at the end, uh, just because there's issues there with a the continuing employee. So we're making modifications on how how it's paid out. We're just clarifying that. And we're also adding a cap on there so that to minimize the liability for the District of Sycamus, that so an employee can only, I believe the cap is 10 weeks, is the most that an employee can put in this retirement bank. And it's it's shifting their vacation to a retirement bank if they don't use it and can only do a week a year. 
So that's, that's the only modification to that policy. And in the exempt employees compensation policy, uh, just three minor changes here, actually four. One is we changed the name from management compensation policy to exempt employee compensation policy because there's not just managers in this policy, it's any non-unionized employee. Uh, under remuneration, uh, we talk about uh, comparables, uh, like, you know, everybody's wage will be between 95 or 105 percent of market. So what's market? It's, there's now a definition in there. It's of similar size municipalities, uh, zero to 10,000 as, as determined by the town manager. So annually, we review every, people's wages. Uh, our local municipalities within a certain population. And that's how we kind of look at where everybody's sitting. So we've just added some wording in there to make it um, more accurate uh, to reflect what we actually do. Um, and sick leave, uh, everybody accrues a day a month. So we just added some wording about proration of that day a month uh, and that, that uh, staff can use it if they have a medical appointment. Um, and the last uh, piece that we added on, which is probably the most significant piece, is when exempt employees um, are part of an EOC and how they are paid over time. So, and we just referred it to um, employment standards. So that's how we're paying overtime for exempt employees because we don't get paid overtime. We get in lieu of overtime. So we get just a fixed amount and we work what we work. Um, so this is a little different if somebody is actually part of an uh, EOC center. And that's it. All right, comments or questions for, go ahead, Jeff. Just looking at the vacation. So I, I'm entitled to 25 days. Uh, there's You've been here eight to 14 years. Yep. So we're, we're entitled for, for 25 days. There's four of us. Sorry, you guys, you get a few days less. You only get 20. <laughs> so I'd like to be at that 10 week compensation package. Okay, hey, we'll, we'll throw it on your retirement bag. <laughs> <laughs> later. We don't get nothing. So. Correct. All right, I'm going to read the resolution. The Council of Vacation Policy Number A19 has presented this 11th day of May 2022nd, and further that Council adopt exempt employee compensation policy number A20 has presented this 11th day of May, replacing the management compensation policy A20. I need a mover on this. Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Evans. Any more comments or questions on this? I'm going to call a question. All those in favor? Very unanimously. Thanks, Kelly. These and charges amending bylaw number 1016 2022 adoption. Recommendation that the district of Sick and Moose fees and charges amending bylaw number 20, 1016 2022 be adopted as presented this 11th day of May 2022. I need a mover on this. Councillor Aries, Councillor Evans. It's an adoption. Anybody want to comment on this? Okay, I'm going to call a question. All those in favor? Unanimously. Thank you. Election assent voting amending bylaw number 1017-2022 adoption. Re recommendation that the District of Sycamus election and assent voting amendment bylaw number 1017-2022 be adopted as presented this 11th day of May 2022. I need a mover. Councillor McCabe, seconded by Councillor Bushell. It's an adoption. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Very unanimously. Thank you. Tax raise bylaw number 2022-2022 adoption. Recommendation that the District of Sycamore's tax rates bylaw number 1022-2022 be adopted as presented this 11th day of May 2022. I need a mover on this. Councillor Bushnell, second by Councillor Malmus. Again, once again, it's an adoption. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, Council Procedure Amendment Bylaw Number 1015, first, second, and third reading. Recommendation that Council Procedure Amending Bylaw Number 1015, 2022, be given first, second, and third reading this ninth day of March 2022. I need a mover on this. Councillor Malmas, Councillor Aries, Jen, you want to give us a short report? <laughs> Absolutely, a short report. Um, so basically, uh, as the result of the pandemic, a ministerial order 192 was issued that allowed fully electronic meetings. Um, since 
the, uh, that Mr. Order has expired, the legislation has been updated to permit it. So if council has it by bylaw. What your current bylaw permits is that up to three of you may participate electronically and the chair must be here in person. Um, unless the mayor declares that in special and extreme circumstances, um, and then a fully electronic meeting can be held, which we utilized in January. What this bylaw before you um, would allow is for anybody to participate electronically, including all of you, including the chair. Um, it's just that flexibility. That doesn't mean it has to be used. It's just flexibility in your in your procedure bylaw. Council does not need to utilize it. Um, we can keep the status quo. It's just if you'd like that option to have fully electronic meetings, um, that uh, that could be uh, adopted by council. All right. Thank you for that, Jen. Any comments or questions on this? All right. Call a question. All those in favor? Heard unanimously. Thanks, Jen. Good neighbor amending bylaw number 1019 2022. Recommendation that the good neighbor amending bylaw number 1019 2022 be given first, second, and third reading this 11th day of May 2022. I need a mover on this. Councillor Evans, second by Councillor Malness. Jen, you want to give us a short report on this as well? Yes, yeah, staff were directed uh, to add some language to our good neighbor bylaw regarding light nuisances. Um, and so we've added that language in there. We've kept it really vague. Basically, nobody should allow an exterior light to become a nuisance. Rather than getting into specifics, uh, that's, that would be hard to enforce. If it's just don't create, don't be a problem, that's going to be easier for John to, to help mitigate and just help work neighbors work between each other. Maybe this OK tire situation of a giant light. Um, I also threw in there some languages about orders to it, but while we're opening up this bylaw, nobody should be creating anything on their property that is a nuisance through odor. Um, and then I also just tidied up the language of defining a nuisance just to align with this new language. All right, comments or questions on this? Go ahead. Get yeah, through the chair, yeah, I like what you did, Jen. Um, I think we need this, we have a few problem uh, businesses that are, are spelling off light into residential areas and uh, it's uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, tackle some of this um, this nuisance I guess thank you I agree all right I'm going to call a question any other comments on this all those in favor Carrie Malcolm wasn't here but uh, correspondence request uh, to acknowledge Mr. Lloyd Gavel for discussion. Request for parking. <coughs> request for street name read. Okay, so um, Daryl, do you want to comment on this? I can uh, briefly through the chair. I was contacted uh, by. Mr. Gavel's daughter, I believe it was. Yeah, Lynn. <clears throat> yeah, and and the the street name request I forwarded this one. Uh, I think I, I said that to Scott. The park bench, we've given them some options as to where okay. we selected a location. Now it's back in their court to pay, and and once the payment's received, we'll go out and install it. That's for that size. Okay. I love it. Go ahead, Jim. Um, I did clarify that Mr. Gabble's daughter um, is looking um, to see if there's any interest from District Council to fund the purchase of the bench. So, what, what is in our policy when it comes to the park bench? Go ahead. I think we discussed it at one time that how expensive is it to get something for free? How much does free cost? And so, you know, to put in a park bench of roughly eighteen hundred bucks, I think, or something, you got to clear space. You got to form and pour concrete, and you know, the the bench itself and the and the the, the memorial tag on the bench. Um, I, I think we'd be setting a precedent here if if we if we donated from say the serendipity fund or something <clears throat> towards a park bench because then where does that end? I, I think. Not that uh, Lloyd is not worthy of a bench. I, I, I support a bench, um, but I, I think we should um, not pay for it only because it sets a precedent. Councilor Bushel? 
Yeah, through the chair, I, I agree with Malcolm. It's, I mean, I think Lloyd is uh, deserving of a street name as well. He's been a huge contributor to the community years ago, and uh, and uh, I I think the world of him. But uh, setting the precedence, we've had a lot of people ask for benches, and uh, if we open up the can now, we'll have to continue with it. So I uh, I agree for sure. Councillor Malmas. Yeah, the the idea of a, of a road is pretty. You gotta wait until somebody does a development and see if you can squeeze the name in there. Because other than that, you're changing somebody's address if you take a street and rename it. So it's got to be basically in a new development area for for a road. Which <clears throat> we had this discussion once before when we talked about the road someplace and had our old town a road. You change that name. Or is goes wacky, right? They gotta notify everybody. So, uh, but I, you know, Lloyd's been around a long time, and and uh, I think, yeah, I agree. That just if we do that, my wife, have you got a bench, Zero? Let's do the chair. We do. We have we have an inventory. Of, I think three or four. No, because my wife's been asking for one for three years. But I'm not so sure about the. Payment on a bench. Like I think like Lloyd Gavel has been a 40 year member of the community. How many years did he pay taxes on his property and he volunteered his time and then you can ask his family in order to pay for the bench? Like, I don't know. I don't agree with that. I think maybe we should set up some sort of fund or something in order to accommodate this, but find another formula in order to, to pay for these benches because most of the people that deserve these benches have really put a lot into these communities. That's why they get recognized with a bench. So I'm not so sure I'm in favor of really down supplying financial <laughs> needs in order to go ahead, Councillor Mons. Through the chair, if you do that, you know who's going to want a bench for free. He's right across from you, my other councillor McKay. He's going to want one for free for his <laughs> well deserving. <laughs> well deserving. <laughs> <laughs> respond to that <laughs> oh my goodness we are getting tired it's it's getting getting tired. <laughs> go ahead councillor mckay um yeah i i still think in and i, I think uh, lloyd gavel's worthy of a bench for sure but um uh, the president setting it i i think if uh lynn sets up a gofundme account she'll get some money for a bench pretty quick um, but I did have some couple ideas for some names for either a street or a location, and just throwing it out there. If we thought, now we always refer to the beach park as the beach park. We've never ever given the beach park a name. It's just the beach park. Um, we could name it the Bagavo Beach Park. Uh, that doesn't change anybody's address. Or we do have a road that's not named yet. Uh, the road allowance between Shoe Shop and Paradise, Jason's right where Lloyd lives. That's that's a road. It's just not built. That's a that's not an easement. That's a road allowance. We we could name that road after Lloyd. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked that one. Bert. <laughs> Housing society might not like it, but Lloyd. <laughs> Like that's closing it down. Councillor Bolmes, you're up. What do you? What do you? You could. I mean, we have trails that we have. We did the Abbott Trail. We we could do the Lloyd Gavel Trail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I'm serious about that road allowance. It is a road. <laughs> it's just not built, but it's a trail. It's so it's not. No, it's a road. Road. no. It's a road allowance, but it'll probably never really be a road. It goes right past the. Uh, Senior Center. I know. <laughs> Councillor Anderson, go yes. ahead. And you're setting a precedent. We're going to run out of roads and, and parks before we run out of people that have contributed to Sick and Moose. So I like the trail idea, but it, I think I don't think we should set a precedent by. Why well, we got Fred Bush laid and Gordon Mack and Mackey and Whitehead Street. And, and we're running out. <laughs> and listen. And it's sad. All right. So. This was brought to the agenda for discussion. So maybe we should think about this a little bit as to where we're gonna go with this. And maybe maybe we can come up with a format that might be 
uh, know, suitable for everybody. Anyway, I want to give it some thought. Go ahead, Jeff. Maybe we could ask staff, uh, I don't know which, or which staff member it would be, but one of the staff to contact this what about a trail because it's way easier to name a trail you know some of the, something that that would have linked some of the things that lloyd had done in the community together basically well, it's just an interesting discussion i think we could ask them that but i think that this is something that's going to be coming along more and more i mean we've got bryant library right here right now that's going to like in 15 or 20 years we're going to have to name something after him as well Right. Yeah, another bed, another free bed. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, well let's let's think about it. What do you think? Daryl? Want to give it some thought? Maybe a trail, maybe a road, whatever. I like the idea of uh, of uh, comes from a cave as well. <clears throat> I think recognition is important, especially when uh, the daughter is asked for recognition. I think it's important. Man's been seriously beneficial to the community. All right, um, moving on. Ah, what do we got? Foundation International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia. Who wants to comment on this? Untouchable light. As far as upcoming International Day against. They're asking us to raise a flag and support. I don't think. Support of the cause. So they could do something on the traffic circle. Um, Daryl, can, can you change the lights? Can you make the lights change intermittently or? Uh, to the chair. Sadly, we can't get more than one color at a time, so we can we can go through some colors. But I think what they're after is flag, rainbow thing. Any more comments on this? As to what we can go ahead, Ryan. I I, I can support. Uh, yeah. uh, it sounds like they'll send us a flag. Yeah. Um, in six days, that would be impressive. But uh, I'd be in, <laughs> I'd be in favor of putting the flag up. <laughs> So who who supplies the flag? They do. They do? Yeah, no, $15. Okay. But you got a flagpole still at your place, don't you? No, but they I think I can down. So where whereabouts would we put the flag up? Flagpole. In District Hall? Oh, yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking a question. Go ahead. Uh, staff could also be directed to do some social media on, on this day as well. Okay. As an option. Okay. Yeah, let's support it. Why not? Any comments on it? No, I support it. Do it in staff's hands. Okay. All right. Uh, for discussion, uh, see right out. Sycamore's dog park. Uh, Daryl. Uh, okay, through the chair, I believe this was a request for uh, chicken wire or a fence. So in our backyard at Public Works, it shares the border with the dog park, and there, there is a wooden fence at that point. Uh, our lagoon in our Public Works yard is secured by a tall fence with, uh, with barbed wire on the top. But this is just into the backyard. So there's marmots in the back 40 right now and I think some dogs from the dog park are running under there and, and going after them. I've asked uh, a local contractor to give me a quote on what it would take to just get a, a gate and a fence in that piece. So I see we can afford it, we'll do it. You got a solution? I think we do, yeah. Okay. Any comments or questions for council on this? Go ahead, Council McGee. Yeah, I, I talked to Chris about this. It's a modest request, and you know he wasn't pushing it or anything. But uh, and quite a few dogs get through there. I'm sure your your workers don't appreciate what's left behind, because uh, I don't think the owners follow them to check and see. So um, it'd be appreciated. I I think you're still gonna 
And so <laughs> that side, so maybe the same contractor can maybe catch that at the same time or something, kind of the scale of economy or whatever. Thank, yeah. uh, thank you for considering that. My buddy thanks you too. <laughs> I'm not refusing myself for conflict. <laughs> All right, Daryl, we'll leave it in your hand. Okay, uh, so uh, correspondence for discussion, Hyde Mountain Development. There's a letter here once again. Scott, do you want to give us a, kind of a rundown on this as to what your take is on this? I can. I, I believe the, the question is, did the district get a referral and did the di district respond? And the district did respond, and that was back in March of last year or April of, of last year. Um, I think you responded that it, you know, it meets the conditions of the uh, of our OCP and supported. And I think we also added that we're also considering um, uh, annexation or boundary expansion as well in that area. Um, <clears throat> one of the questions I think is about the road, and there is a covenant on the property. I remember at the time the property was initially rezoned. Um, District of Sycamus asked for a covenant to be put on that there'd be. Um, I think it was 151 units and prior to prior to going past 151 units or dwelling units and the, the highway intersection would have to be improved. And uh, I believe right now I did call the CSRD and ask today. Um, right now they do have the subdivision for um, there, there's a RV strata park being proposed there now. I believe they do have Ministry of Transportation, it is in front of Ministry of Transportation for uh, comments or approval for that, that subdivision. So as far as the road goes, District Sickness did ask for that covenant to be put on the property with the number of units and Ministry of Transportation might be considering it. That's really all the information I have on it. There's a lot of moving parts when it comes to this particular letter, but go ahead, Councillor Anderson. Thank you. And the reason I brought it in as a late item is we, we like I said, have had a couple of, of comments, one from Terry, one from Corey. And I think because it's 100 units that are approved over there, whatever it is, their, their concern is the safety on the road. As soon as that's done, like between the new section of, of highway off the bridge to Mara Hills, which now is Hyde Mountain, Mary Hills. So the concern is the safety on that road because there is so much traffic and it's unsafe right now. And the other question that they did have was concerning the water and sewer out there. Is, it, is the CSRD getting water and sewer from the district? Is it, was, are we hooking them up or um, how are they going about that? Well, depending on, go ahead, Evan, and then the, the short thing is the short answer is the proponent who has purchased Hyde Mountain, which is now Mara Hills, would like to hook up to water sewer, and that would require a service agreement with us. Um, they they like the fact that our services are relatively close because we've met with the new ownership group, and so they're going to be uh, entertaining those discussions once they start with their plans. Just one more question. Was there any discussion with the CSRD regarding the road um, when this was in the planning stages? Jeff, can you answer that question? Was there any discussion with regards to the Hyde Mountain and the, the uses of the road and the amount of development that they were? Uh, my, my understanding to the chair was years ago when they first did Hyde Mountain because of the intersection they're only allowed to build 60 units there and there's a couple other properties that were allowed to build like the hilltop up there the red roof they were allowed to build a certain amount of units as well now i don't know if that ever had an expiry date on it but i uh, to my understanding even just before uh, brian winters took it over the maximum units they could build there till that intersection is done is 60 units we can't do any more of that. Just go ahead. Moon Bridge has, has removed that covenant. The covenant didn't have a timeline on it. It, it was just uh, the intersection of Trans Canada and Old Small Machine Road. So, with the new uh, road bridge and the increased uh, traffic, uh, you know, with the underpass and all that, so there's no no restrictions 
on development out there anymore because of MOT anymore. If I could through the chair, so, so we're, we're saying the Broome Bridge could be five years out yet, depending on archaeological and this and then, and if, we, if BVI builds it, it's 10 years out. So they can, they can basically build the whole thing out. There's still the same access. Well, it, it's subject to, of course. Right? Wow. So uh, is the, when I take a look at this letter, uh, did you bring this to the, this correspondence? But it does not. I did. I asked for it to be put on the agenda because we did get correspondence as a late item. But I think the biggest concern is the safety on that road, yeah. even right now. Now we're adding uh, a bunch of trucks and trailers and homes and fifth wheels going on. RVs. RVs. So why are you shaking your head, Chad? No, this is definitely a concern. I got it's a concern. But the thing is, is that there's a lot of unanswered questions up till this point in regards to this ladder, right? And we don't have the answers to some of these questions up to this point that I see, because first off, um, it depends on the development out at Hyde Mountain, when the development's gonna take place, the development of the Broome Bridge, I mean, uh, the traffic flow, I mean, there's I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions in my opinion, but I, I don't know where we're gonna go with this. I mean, we could give them an update as to what we're doing and what we know, obviously, and maybe that may be a, a part of the solution. Go ahead, Jeff. To the chair, I mean, it's currently in the CSRD. There's a, there's a light in the sand where the district of Sycamore said, and we're talking about annexation. If we annex it, then, then we become the responsible party to upgrade or straighten out the road. Also, you have the First Nations IR3. That in itself is uh, when we were on the ride, they're, they're in talking about what they might want to do. They've asked for a uh, service and bylaw uh, service agreement. So for water and sewer for that property. So uh, I'd much rather the CSRD pay to straighten that road out and fix it up to us. Then we'll annex it in. Like right after. You got to get some benefit out of this. But it's in the CSRD. It's not in the District of Sycamores. Yes, they have to drive through a piece of the road that's part of ours. But uh, who pays the district for the maintenance of that road? It's in the district of Sycamore's, correct, Carol? Uh, just to the limits. Yeah, just to the limits. But after that, uh, AIM and the MOTI pay for the rest of it out to, to hide. That's correct. And there's IR3 in there, too. Yeah. Oh, well, you can put the responsibility of the, of the, to the upland owner. <laughs> I <don't... laughs> um, uh, can I suggest that maybe we... <laughs> We suggest to these people, I think Evan did that already, this is a CSRD, that we, they should send this letter to the CSRD. Well, that's a good idea. We were a referral in the subdivision, but we didn't have a vote. So we didn't have a vote, so we're not accountable. So it should, I agree with Council Momus, this should be directed to the CSRD. It's their road. We get back to Corey Mitchell and Terry and let them know that they should forward this to CSRD. All right, so um, I guess we can probably reply to these people and give them what we do know and what the uh, future might hold. All right, any other discussion around this? All right, uh, correspondence for information. Anybody here want to talk on any one of these particular uh, items of correspondence. Councillor McCabe, you're up, and then Councillor Anderson. Just two quick ones. For the interior health one about the 1 800 number, um, that's a new number for not just for seniors, but mainly for seniors. I wonder if we could post that number on our website somewhere that they can find it easily because it's a new number. And then down almost to last there, Ted and Diane Leduc. There. Hey, I thought, yeah, I guess nice. stop talking. <laughs> Um, they're asking for a name to bear contest across the street here, the, 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 the carved bear. That should have, in my mind, have been up here as an action item because they're, they're asking for uh, the district to start a name to bear contest. That I'll make a motion if you wish. Well, 
do we need a motion? Just right, ask just direct, direct staff, direct yeah. staff to. Okay. Yes. So I'd ask council support to just direct staff that we. It's, it would be a fun thing for recreation to, uh, yeah, engage the public, name the bear. Good idea. Either boo boo or yoga. Bear bear. Okay. Oh, yeah. Maybe yoga bear. Big Bucky or whatever. <laughs> we had calls. I just want to make two quick comments. I want to first of all thank um, council for um, letting us move forward with the letters for the luxury tax. Um, um, recreational boats or vehicles, whatever it turns into. Um, we're getting some feedback there, and I think that that was uh, a, a good step for us. And we're, we've, we've always been trendsetters, so um, we're joining in to hear that uh, or joining in to support us. And the other thing is, I'm really happy with the um, Quiggins zebra mussels, where lots of people are supporting that too, and that's something that should never leave our radar. So I'm happy to see that we're getting some support back on that as well. That's all. All right. Any other? Go ahead, board. Thanks to the chair. I just yeah, I support Colleen on that, and thank everybody for writing letters in. But uh, it, it, I just want to say it's uh, Kelly's birthday today. Oh I want to wish Kelly a happy birthday, and we should end this meeting so she can go home and see her kids. <laughs> <laughs> Real fun birthday, huh? Happy oh, birthday, yeah, it's good. Kelly. Yeah, a meeting till nine o'clock at night. <laughs> Party. Party. <All> right. <laughs> Party. <laughs> So yeah, so um, recommendation that the regular council meeting for uh, May Kelly's birthday, 2022, be adjourned. The time being <laughs> quarter to nine. Unbelievable! Happy birthday, by the way, Kelly. Thank you. Okay, I need a mover on that. So, Councilor Erich, Council Evans. Thanks so much. In favor. Thanks to Deb and Brian for hanging in there with us. And Who won the bet. Uh, I had 8.52. Uh, we were talking 9 o'clock. Okay. What did you have? 52. 